So welcome everybody. Welcome to be here today to our fall 2023 CAPE Interprofessional Student so Showcase. We have so many students here with wonderful presentations. I want to make a special thank you to Michelle Cody and Chris Hall who tirelessly pulled together so many moving parts to make this work. Um, and also to all the faculty who supported the students throughout the semester um, in this extracurricular and co-curricular activity. We really so appreciate your generosity and your time. So I'm excited to say that today's work highlights the work of 76 students from 14 professions, from undergraduate, graduate, and we even have a UNE alum who is part of the presentations today. And they have a lot to say about what they've learned about teamwork, about social determinants of health, about lots of different subjects that they've done from a team perspective. So we're super excited about that. Um, we'll have presentations today from our interprofessional team immersion teams. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, and we really invite you to get involved, um, it is a semester long team-based telehealth simulation engaging teams of students in clinical scenarios with standardized patients. We also have folks here, uh, students here, who have done student-led interprofessional mini-grants that involve scholarship, research, community projects, um, and uh, we get a lot of support for that from our Office of Research and Scholarship. We also have folks here from the FIT team, um, and FIT, and I'm going to get this wrong, Ling, I know I am, Public Health Problem Solving Paradigm Training. Um, led by Dr. Ling Sao, which uses interprofessional case-based learning to highlight um, and contextualize the impacts of social determinants on health. And you're going to hear some amazing presentations from that group. And we're going to have some um, students who will be presenting uh, service learning projects uh, that were done interprofessionally in partnership with the WCHP Service Learning Office. Um, so, Thanks for being here. We're really excited to move this forward. And it is now my absolute pl pleasure <laughs> to introduce my colleague and friend, Dean Jen Morton, who will give us some opening remarks. Well, hello everyone. And Shelley, thank you for the invite. I'm so delighted to be here for this year's student showcase. It's always um, so, so uh, it makes us all feel so proud every year to see how far our students have come with this important model of care. Um, I'm so proud of all of the students uh, between um, those of you who are doing this uh, as an extracurricular um, activity or uh, co-curricular, or if it's actually embedded in your curriculum, it's a huge commitment. And it's one that's going to pay off as you enter practice. We have data from a lot of our accredited programs that we have to provide surveys for after graduation. And without question, uh, clinical settings uh, regard UNE students as being light years ahead of other students with respect to being able to work in teams, have conversations with other members of the team. And that, that, that's all ties back to the to the infrastructure here at UNE. So we have um, a lot to be proud of, and um, it, you'll see it all come alive after graduation. The other thing I wanted to mention is I'm so um, happy to see so many folks focusing on population health within their within their projects. Um, the um, it really became an important competency, um, I think five or six years ago, Shelley can correct me if I'm wrong. And for me, having that knowledge of population health or perhaps a, a patient that has an epidemiologic roadmap to a condition that are, that are oftentimes informed by those social determinants, this is all coming alive for our students. And it's something that's, that's um, so important in healthcare. It's that that population health and the social determinants represent the light bulb that helps you understand what patients are experiencing in their health and in, in the other ways that we care for them. So once again, I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait to see the presentations and thank you again for the invite. Well, thank you, Jen. 
Thank you very much. We, we're excited that you're excited and we're glad that you're here. And I am now going to pass it along to Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so thrilled to have you here to celebrate student team projects during your lunch break, which leads us to a very important update. Uh, while we can't change the day of the week or the time of most of our events, in an effort to increase accessibility to IPE for our students, most of our spring 2024 knowledge exchange events will be about 50 minutes long. We'll generally start at noon with about five minutes of polls, so it's okay to arrive a couple of minutes late, and then we'll end at 12.55, especially keeping in mind that many of you have one o'clock classes. Some of the topics we will cover next semester are the health professional's role in reducing pharmaceutical waste, overcoming cultural and disability barriers to healthcare for our new Mainers, and addressing harm reduction and associated wound care. I hope to see you on Wednesdays in the spring, and now I'd like to pass it to Chris Hall, our program manager. Chris? Thank you, Michelle. Sorry, I was not off mute there. Um, and so seeing you Wednesdays in the spring are, is a way to build your way toward your uh, application for your honors distinction, and I hope that you will uh, do that. We ask for reflections based on the four interprofessional competencies as you attend the knowledge exchanges. And this particular knowledge exchange counts for communication and teamwork if you plan to reflect upon it. Uh, and we love to award the honors distinction upon graduation to recognize your extracurricular and co-curricular uh, efforts. Uh, this poster session slash student showcase is uh, not just an academic exercise. I want to uh, take a moment to let you know that your work in IPE, which you have all done over the course of the semester of the last year, IPE is uh, continues to be an emerging field in healthcare, and you can move scholarship and research forward through the work that you're doing. And I hope that you will be lifelong learners and teachers um, and one way to do this is to present your scholarship and your work at uh, national and regional conferences. And I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate this particular poster, which has gone to a national, uh, this project has been at a national conference twice and was at a regional conference just at the beginning of November, sharing information about uh, harm reduction and an interprofessional approach to that for people who are um, leaving incarceration. And so I hope that you will all uh, take your work forward and present it and, and move the field of interprofessional uh, scholarship and research forward. You have the tools and uh, you are leaders by the fact that you are here with us now. This is a multidisciplinary approach to patient care. I'm Kelly Bowers. I'm a second year nutrition student at UNE. My name is Zach Chern, and I'm a second year medical student at Roslyn Franklin. I'm Josh Hall. I'm a second year dental student at UNE. A quick introduction to the case is the patient is a six year old uh, female that is presenting with chronic asthmatic episodes. Uh, the patient and her family has recently moved to a new home in a rural area. The patient has the familial considerations listed. The school has shown concern on her recent status, and she is currently on a new reg regimen of medication. We are Team 3, also known as the Meerkat Mob, and our care team consisted of the members listed here. So considering the osteopathic, allopathic, and physician assistant perspective on the case, some of the biggest concerns were uh, establishing and confirming the patient's diagnosis of asthma and curating an ideal medication regimen to improve symptoms and quality of life. The following pharmacological interventions were utilized. Some additional concerns included the fact that the patient was clearly lacking in continuity of care as a result of the family's move, frequent urgent care visits that were rushed and not comprehensive, a uh, large medication regimen that was not instructed on how to use, be used appropriately and adequately. And so inquiring about the current plan and additional substances and supplements were a huge step in the right direction, as well as understanding compliance barriers. So for the dental hygiene and dental medicine approach, uh, we were aware that the primary concerns of the patient are not regarding the patient's oral hygiene. Therefore, we attempt to take a holistic approach to the case looking at the patient's overall health. In addition to this, we are aware that improving the patient's symptoms in the oral cavity will greatly improve her quality of life. Some of the concerns that needed to be addressed was the family's access to fluoridated water, possible uh, dry mouth caused by uh, medications, and possible carious lesions that are already present. Um, some possible clinical interventions would be fluoride uh, supplements and suggested visits to dental clinics. Occupational therapy, social work, and nutrition had some overlap in our interests and in possible interventions. 
Our primary concerns were with how Charlotte's illness, uh, the family's recent move and a new baby on the way were disrupting the family's usual roles, routines and habits. And we wanted to leverage existing community supports to mitigate further disruption. We're also concerned with how her illness was impacting her personally with like her school and social inter interactions, her mental health, nutrition, sleep, and what realistic changes could we make to improve these. Ultimately, our goal was to find out how we could address these concerns and best support Charlotte and her family. Considering some of the lessons learned from this case and from the team, we learned that multidisciplinary teams improve the quality of care for patients far beyond any sort of individual or separate care that we can provide. Integrating care secures full and continuous support for the patient throughout all stages and enhances the patient experiences. Healthcare providers can develop critical and long lasting relationships amongst one another while bolstering quality improvement and continuing education. And ultimately, this improves the quality of life for the provider and patient alike. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Meerkat Mob. I'm Sarah Garber, and I'm facilitating this session. I'm from Rosalind Franklin. I think we have members of the team here. Are there any questions for the team? If not, I will put one out there. Um, for the team members, how did you determine which roles and responsibilities in your team project and how you interacted with the patient? I can take that. My name is Erin. I'm a DO student at UNE and we met beforehand before each of these telehealth visits and we planned on certain objectives that we wanted to address with the patient's mother and father and me and the other uh, MD student and PA student took a look at medications and then we had a dental student and a dental hygienist student that looked at oral health considerations. And a big part of this case was also utilizing social work to leverage um, access. They were, I think, two hours away from the nearest doctor. They had moved into a home and there was risk of mold exposure. So just having us all kind of use our strengths to address all parts of this really complex case that was not black and white um, was really important. Thank you for that. If anybody would like to ask a question and put it in the chat, please do so. It can be hard for me to identify hands raised. Um, one question from the chat was, were there any tensions with the overlap between roles or opportunities discovered with those overlaps? I can take that one. Um, we kind of, in our team, I think we all just meshed really well and we just the communication was the biggest part in like introducing the roles and how we went between the roles. Um, we like based on our objectives, like Aaron said, we decided who we wanted to go in to the interview and ask the questions. Um, overall, I mean, we, I think we just worked really well as a group and there wasn't that much tension between any of us. Thank you so much. Another question question from the chat is, how has this ex experience altered your career path or influenced your career path? I think for that question, I've been thinking about this a lot since this experience, and it has really opened my eyes to how complex patient cases are, and they're not, you know, a disease card. There's, you know, family considerations, environmental. And so to take on these really complex cases, you need to utilize your resources. So moving forward, I'm definitely going to use my allies in healthcare, whether that be um, pharmacy, pharmacy students or social workers are really important in helping your patient live a full and happy life. Thank you. Um, also from the chat, did a leader emerge, a specific leader, or was it more of a fluid leadership type of situation within the team? I can take that. Um, I think we did really well about just kind of trading off and sort of, you know, somebody would sort of take the lead for the first interview, and then we would kind of move on from there, depending upon what we learned. But I think we did a really good job of just allowing that to be fluid and figuring out who would be best to take on that role to best serve the patient. Excellent. That sounds like real cooperation and a lot of communication. And with that, what was the biggest take-home message that you, you found with this experience? I think I just how important it is to find sort of those allies in healthcare, like Aaron said before, and just really utilizing the whole team and understanding that everyone has something to contribute. Excellent. Any last thoughts or comments? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Team Meerkat Mom. Excellent presentation. And we look forward to seeing you in practice. Welcome. We are Team Coyote.
Thanks for joining us today. We are going to present to you the importance of patient education. The team today that, uh, this is the team that helped us put our case together. And the team that will be presenting to you today is Mahal Averas Bacchus, Regina Wu, myself, Jessica Cilio, and Sarah McAndrews. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah to run through the case with you. The case that we worked on was about Charlotte, who is a six-year-old girl who has been diagnosed with allergen-induced asthma. Recently, her family moved to the suburbs away from the city, and Mr. and Mrs. Soto have been worried about their daughter due to her lack of energy, frequent urgent care visits, and the many medications she has been given and is currently taking without much background information. Since they moved, they are a 30-minute drive to the closest urgent care, and they're experiencing financial constraints and are dependent on Mr. Soto's VA disability as Mrs. Soto is not working. They have no extended family support, and have not established a new healthcare team yet. And now I'll pass it to Regina for the case process. During the care process, we focus on educating the parents about Charlotte's med medications, such as when to take them, how often, and performing oral care after use. We suggested formulating an asthma action plan and obtaining a nebulizer for easier inhaler use. Advice on discontinuation of Montelukas and avoiding use of natural supplements. Lastly, we recommended a consult with social services to provide care and community resources in their new place of living. Now I'll pass it on to Mahal. We had a couple of key takeaways. Um, some of them included making sure that pa patients were on the care team as members who deserve complete information about medications in order to make informed decisions about what they wanted to include on their medication panel and what they didn't want to include based off of side effects. We also learned a lot about how social determinants of health um, and access to health care really act as barriers to wellness and health outcomes. And finally, we thought a lot about the importance of community and resources and access to resources and how to connect our patients to those resources. With that, we would like to give a special thank you to our facilitators of this case study who helped us. Um, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Team Coyote. Uh, please feel free to put questions in the chat. I, if you raise your hand, I may hopefully we'll see you, but if you're raising your hand and just want to unmute and, and shout out, that's also fine too. And we are open for questions for this team. I can start off with the team. It was a pleasure working with you. I was the facilitator for this team. But what was the takeaways that you learned from each other? What, what do you think you will take on in your professional life? As a lesson. Uh, I can jump in. Um, we there was a lot actually to that list. It was uh, a great experience. I think I think it's one I had no idea. You kind of come in for one reason and take away so much more on the end. Um, but one of the biggest takeaways I think for me is just the realization of what uh, the other positions in this group, uh, how important they really were, and maybe the different aspects that they could bring to the table that. Um, I wasn't even aware of. Um, I think the social worker was the biggest takeaway for me or a ha aha moment where it was like, oh my gosh, this person is so valuable to the team and what they can bring. And I, I mean, I always knew they were a valuable person, but there was just so much more that they were able to bring to the table that I just didn't fully appreciate before this experience. Yeah, I agree with Jessica. Like also when I was coming in, um, Obviously, I knew, I knew about all of these healthcare roles, but I didn't know what exactly, like all the specifics that they're about. Um, I feel like as a nurse, we learn a lot about every field, but we don't go in depth into every role, um, if that makes any sense. But yeah, so I, I feel like I learned a lot about everybody and what they do. And it was... It was actually really fun and really nice chatting with everyone just to get different perspectives um, on what to do with the case. So. It's often different learning about things versus doing those things and getting the takeaway there. Uh, there's a question in the chat um, about you, the team spent a lot of time on patient education and finding resources. Were there any resources that you found that surprised you or you didn't know about beforehand? Um, I, I would jump back to the social worker um, and probably uh, I think she was a much bigger part in our case study than it, that we focused on. We did focus on a lot of the medica uh, medication um, side of it because uh, we felt 
um, there was a lot and it sounded like the, the parents really needed, they were uncertain of all the side effects, I believe. And, and so really providing that education felt very important in this situation. Um, and it was really cool as a team, us coming together to really figure that out. And then who was the best person to provide that education? Because there's several different areas from the social worker to the nurses, doctors. Um, so um, yeah, I think the social worker probably was the biggest takeaway for me because she could have offered so much as far as just family support and local support there. Of, um, and uh, and so, yeah, that was probably my biggest takeaway. Interesting. We learn so much when we participate, don't we? Um, are there any opportunities for the community to support clients that surprised you or that you learned about and didn't know about before? Let me make sure I understand that question. Opportunities for our community to support those clients. So different services. Is that what that question is asking? Community resources, I think. Um, yeah, I think there's a ton of resources, more than I think... I know me personally, even now, like, I, I think my world just keeps expanding the more I learn and jump into the healthcare <laughs> profession. Um, but I know even like our, like our homeless shelters, they offer a ton of help, more help than I even realized. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for even healthcare professionals to work with these um, community services to even expand uh, the opportunities that some of these individuals could have. Did I answer that? Absolutely. That? Thank okay. you. <laughs> and finally, what was the hardest thing about this for you? I personally didn't really find it that difficult, maybe because we had so many, like so many people in our team that were all willing to like speak up and give their opinions and feedback and whatnot. Um, but I think the only challenge we had was during the second meeting when our dental student and our social worker student couldn't make it to the meeting. And it was tough because the dental student was the um, healthcare professional that we had placed as the uh, familiar face with the patient from the very beginning. So we kind of lost that. And then so we had to introduce new healthcare workers to the patient. And then again, like Jessica said, the social worker, she, if she was there at our second meeting, she could have been able to provide so much more information to the patient than we could. Like we could only come up with so much, but, and there's, I'm sure for social workers, they have a special way of delivering information to the patient that we probably could have done better with, but that, that was the only challenge I found. I absolutely agree with that, Regina. And the only thing I would tag on to the end is I was looking for like this solid answer, like here is the fix to your problem. And in these situations, in case there's just not one fix, it was really like, a, it's an, a continuous thing. So at the end of it, I just, I wanted to see how, you know, Mrs. Soto was doing and how her baby was and like the follow-up and it almost became real, which it was kind of fun, but, um, so it wasn't really a problem, but just kind of a fun thing on the end. It was like, I wish there would have been like, oh, how are they doing in that follow-up? I can provide that follow-up. We do have another case with Mrs. Soto and she does deliver and everybody's fine. It was a little dicey there, but everybody's okay. So thank you so much for that. I think we're ready to, um, thank you so much for your presentation and great job. And we will move to the next presentation. Okay, we are going to start our next presentation from the Life Saving Lobsters Team 4, the Interprofessional Team Immersion at FD. A student dentist, pharmacist, nutritionist, doctor, occupational therapist, and social worker walk into a Zoom meeting for the first time. They're told to work together as an interprofessional team. What could go wrong? Our group analyzed the interprofessional healthcare delivery over telehealth pros and cons. Our group consisted of Lauren Elblatt from Dental Medicine, Ethan Gagnon from Pharmacy, Luciana Gizzo from Osteopathic Medicine, Anna Lindenmayer from Occupational Therapy, Christine Papa from Applied Nutrition, and Rachel Ryan from Social Work. We were supervised by Denise Blaze, Patricia Day, and Dr. Kim Lee. Thank you so much for your support. We shared many unknowns with one another about our professions prior to meeting each other. Our biases and gaps in knowledge centered on uncertainty around our scope of practice, philosophy of care, and nature of work. 
we found it to be an enriching conversation that expanded understandings of each field, and we took this new knowledge into our simulation. As a team, we discussed some of our interprofessional goals at the start of our simulation experience. Some of those were considering the effects of telehealth on patient access to care, as well as the effect of distance on patient treatment adherence and healthcare outcomes, utilizing motivational interviewing to connect with and validate patient experience despite barriers of telehealth, share team biases of health professions and work towards a greater understanding of one another's field. We outlined many advantages and disadvantages in our poster, but our key takeaway was the importance of streamlined communication. While our diverse team brought a wealth of perspectives, we, re we realized that presenting information to the SOTOs in a cohesive and efficient manner proved challenging. In hindsight, we recognize the need for a more structured communication strategy, perhaps assigning a lead spokesperson or utilizing a concise summary document that integrates perspectives from various professions. Furthermore, our experience highlighted the significance of striking the right balance between inclusivity and efficiency. While involving multiple healthcare professions enriched our understanding, it also led over led to over analysis and potential delays in delivering recommendations. In future endeavors, we would consider a more targeted selection of professions directly relevant to the case at hand, ensuring a focused and efficient collaboration. This approach would enable us to maintain the benefits of diverse perspectives while mitigating the challenges associated with information overload. Overall, our learnings emphasize the importance of refining our collaborative processes to enhance the impact of interprofessional healthcare teams in delivering optimal patient care. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, lobsters. It sounds like a lot can happen when a number of uh, healthcare professionals get into a room and are given a case. So if you have a question, please shout it out or put it in the chat. I can't always see you if you raise your hand. So feel free to do that. And I can get started on this um, by asking how you determine, how did the team determine the roles or who should be working with the patient at a particular time. How was that done? What were the, was there a fluid leadership style or a set leader? I can take this one. Um, I'm the social work student. My name's Rachel. I think that we were approaching it pretty horizontally and collaboratively, and none of us really wanted to step forward initially, which I think as our presentation showed was really beneficial in terms of us learning from everyone, like as what we do as professionals and what we can bring to a case. Um, I think that some of the order of approaching our patients sort of was determined by the case itself and what their needs were how we prioritized them and that kind of determined who went first who went second etc were there any bottom lines that that you would say about leadership or suggestions that you could give to the next group of students perhaps perhaps i would say that there are pros and cons to both having an established leader and taking a more fluid approach to it i think that definitely determining that earlier on as a team would be helpful to like the efficacy of the team itself. Um, and I also think that if there were a determined leader, I think that creating a space where collaboration and sharing opposing opinions was welcomed and encouraged would actually be be beneficial. And just going off of that, um, I'm Luciana. I'm the comm student who's a part of this project. I think having a streamlined leaner is kind of like a point of reference for Mrs. Soto would be helpful too. So she has somebody that she knows she can rely on for direct communication. And I think our team did a really good job of directly addressing her in different settings when it was appropriate for each person. But I think having her one person that she could connect with would be really helpful as well. Thank you for those insights. There's a question in the chat, which starts off, Sometimes in IPTI, an unexpected profession ends up having a larger role in a case due to a client or caregiver report. Was that something that the life-saving lobsters experienced? I feel like pharmacy played a very big role in our group. I think it was very pharmacologically heavy. And I think me as the dental student, I had a bit of a smaller role. So that was interesting for me to take a step back. Do you feel as though the all the members of your team were more or less on an equal footing with the client or was there one person that was more interactive with this, the client and, and actually the client, the parents of the client? I don't, I didn't really notice like a difference in rapport amongst all the professionals. Um, I do think given the nature of the case as 
Lauren said some people interacted more with Mr. and Mrs. Soto, uh, but that was more just determined on their needs rather than, than how they were getting along or the relationship that was building between them. I agree with, with Rachel, I think, and also Rachel did a wonderful job, I think, as the social worker and I think social work and pharmacy were the two predominant leaders in our case, just based on the needs that Mrs. Soto was communicating. We felt that, that at the time that that was the best way to address all of our concerns was to have her, Rachel, and Ethan be at the forefront. And I think everybody else that had smaller roles in the case still communicated really professionally with, with Mrs. Soto as well. Thank you for that. What was the hardest thing you encountered about teamwork? Um, I'll speak for myself. I found that timing was always just way too little of it. Um, especially like I was so interested in, in learning from everyone. This was my first time interacting with a lot of the different professions and everyone had so much to like bring to this case in terms of how they conceptualized it. And I feel like we were just coming up with way more ideas and were possible to fit into the the short 20 minute interactions we had with the patient. So striking that balance was, I think, something that we we struggled with and would be something I would keep in mind in the future. Are there any takeaways that each of you would bring or continue to carry with you as you become professionals and are out there on your own with the I think for me, as um, as a future physician, it was a really great opportunity to see exactly what the other professions do. This is my first time interacting with a lot of these professions. So I think it'll really help me with my patient care in the future, because now I have a better understanding of exactly what my colleagues do and how they can be helpful. Yeah. And I think also I created new friendships with these people. So I will definitely lean on them in the future when I run into problems in dentistry. And I'm taking away the value of like different perspectives and in approaching a case and like client needs. Thank you. I think having those phone numbers of, of your now friends and colleagues is very important going forward. Any words of advice to the next IPD team that's going to come up and deal with the case in the next IPD sessions this spring, summer, or spring, I think. Maybe striking a balance between information gathering and information presentation that is timely and effective. It's going off of that, I think time management in general is a key p part of this case. Like we were saying, we came up with so many ideas, but you're limited, especially in the telehealth world in general. And that's a good skill for us to learn of how to really prioritize and address their concerns as best you can in the time that you're given. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll wrap this presentation up. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Great job. Our next presentation from the Interprofessional Team Immersion Program is going to be the Squid Squad, Team 6. Good evening. This is our IPTI Honors Distinction presentation, Bridging the Path Towards Exemplary Care, A Journey Shared Amongst Professionals. Our team consisted of, of osteopathic medicine, nutrition, social work, dentistry, and physical therapy. Our approach was to first begin by gathering information about living conditions, both previous and current, medications, symptoms, and all of the concerns that the parents and child have. We then began to build bridges, which are collating plans to utilize knowledge from active research to attack previous concerns and current concerns, side effects of medications, and to clear up any discrepancies amongst the parents or child. We then applied that knowledge for them in a way that Mr. and Mr. Soto could actively implement into their home and provided solutions for different pathways and education for moving forward. To our revisions from our original plan, we took individual analysis and incorporated both that and the parents' um, concerns and collaborated in order to find a new plan. We took that new plan and took it into the patient encounter where we were able to further address the parents' concerns. Through an additional debrief, we were, allow, we were able to absorb critical feedback from the parents in order to change our plan further and further address their concerns appropriately. Okay, so just discussing everything that we've done by dividing our sessions into two parts, we were able to kind of learn and reflect on all the choices that we've done you know, um, listening to the patients, which is where everything starts off, being able to address needs one by one, um, finding solutions, then kind of starting the process over when they have new questions and they're coming to the meet. Um, 
the conclusion allowed us to follow a systemic approach laid out for us and establish positive and healthy communication between members of the multidisciplinary team and the patient as well. And that is all we have today. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your presentation, Team Squibs. I have one to start with, and, and that is you said that you had an original plan and then modified it. How did that work with your team? Was there a leader? How, what was the discussion like? Um, I could take that one. Um, so when I say we had a plan, just kind of piggybacking off from the very first session we had for like um, the, the very first breakout room, we listened to the patient. We kind of gathered all the information. We examined all the medications she had and um, everybody kind of like went to work in their respective field on how to combat that, if there's any possible side effects and stuff. Um, I was part of the nutrition and I know she talked about holistic options. So I know on my end, I looked into the supplements that she listed to see if that would have any interactions with her medicine and if there was something that I could um, advise her on in place of that. Um, I wouldn't say that we had a definite leader. It kind of just, um, went around, we kind of said, hey, you know, um, I think we should take it from this approach or someone would be like, hey, I think we should, you know, do more of this or less of that or whatever. It was every, everyone was really involved and um, were very strong in their input. So more of a fluid leadership style. Was there any particular yeah. profession or professions that were? Um, other member, Liz, I think she did osteopathic medicine because the, we felt like the situation kind of needed more of that. So I know she was a, a common ground for that and getting information and knowing about the medications and being able to kind of um, recommend or prescribe what was needed for her to help out with her, um, with the patient's interactions. What's the hardest thing about the teamwork, working in a team? Deciding, um, I, probably do. Um, I think for me, the hardest part was definitely just trying to decide where the best path where to take, because in that first session that we had, um, we did a really good job at gaining all the information that we possibly could. But then after that, our heads were almost a little scrambled because we were like, now we have to put all these pieces together. We did such a great job at, you know, gathering all this information but now we're like what is the most important thing to address and what is going to be most helpful to this family to move forward in the best way so that we can then start to address all the problems but what do we need to attack now Sam, do you have anything to add i just felt that the probably the most challenging was um how to balance between all the different um health fields so everyone has enough knowledge and a lot of knowledge in their own field but then coming together and kind of determining who needs to kind of take a step forward and who take, needs to take a step back. That balance, that was kind of the biggest challenge, I thought. Was it hard to sort of trust or lean on each other for that kind of knowledge? If you felt you didn't have it, the knowledge for with your profession, was it hard to sort of trust? No, I don't think so. I, I kind of just was able to trust that everyone in their own field had that knowledge. So uh, at least for me, I, I I didn't have any issue with that. Sounds like your team created a safe space for each other. What would you say is sort of a bottom line if you were advising the next group of students going through an IFTI simulation? What would you want to tell them? I would say, you know, have fun with it, but, um, you know, make sure that communication is frequent and established sooner. Um, I feel like, you know, my group, everyone is so smart and um, they know what to do when it comes to working together and putting things together. But I know um, it was kind of, it took a while for us to get going. Um, we just, you know, we have school and we have rotations going on. I know I have my clinical cell going on. Everybody has their stuff going on. And I know it would have been, I think we would have felt better if we would have got started on everything a little sooner. So um, just kind of getting that established would, would help. I think another important thing is just being able to be flexible because we had an additional an original plan, but it was important for us to be able to change the plan quickly 
in that debrief in order to best address what the parents brought up because we weren't exactly sure what they wanted to address and we went into the encounter so it was important for us to be able to be flexible to adjust and I think keeping one person in all of the encounters was also helpful to build rapport and have a safe base for the parents to look towards even if they're not speaking just having them in the room was helpful for us because they knew that that person was aware of everything that happened during all the encounters so they knew what was going on so aspects of communication team management and some consistency would be important does that kind of sum it up definitely okay well thank you so much Our presentation is the interprofessional approach to asthma management through telehealth. My name is Elise Grabowski, and I'm a dental medicine student. I'm Bree Detty, and I'm a medical student. I'm Sarah Lucas, and I'm a nursing student. I'm Darina Shannon, and I'm a dietetic student. I'm Kylie Yoshikawa, and I'm a physical therapy student. Charlotte Soto is a six-year-old who has been suffering from allergen-induced asthma since she was four. She lives with her mother, father, and younger brother, who all recently moved to an old two-bedroom home in a remote rural region. Our interdisciplinary team's goal was to address Charlotte's case with a patient-centered approach where we used active listening, motivational interviewing, communication, and educational skills to work through the different social determinants of health. Common environmental factors associated with asthma triggers are air quality, pollutants, and allergens. Other triggers may be physical activity, respiratory infections, and emotional stress. Prevention and minimizing exposure to asthma triggers can contribute to a decrease in the frequency and severity of asthma exacerbations. Prior to our visit with Charlotte, she received her medical care through urgent care visits with limited continuity of care. She had difficulty attending in-person visits and the closest pharmacy was 30 minutes away. Telehealth became a useful tool for managing her care. Although it came with its own challenges, Charlotte's parents were able to meet with a team of experts and we used a patient-centered approach. Our social worker was also an incredible asset for building patient rapport and identifying resources. Medical appointments and medication are known to be expensive, but everything else is often overlooked, such as insurance, commuting expenses, internet, and home modifications. The cost varies from patient to patient because some patients might have to spend more in one area than the other based on living situation, severity of asthma, and levels of access. An important step is connecting to her school nurse to ensure her care plan is being adequately implemented and to advocate for Charlotte. Another concern is the family's lack of support. To address this, we would connect Charlotte's family to support groups and therapists. To support Charlotte's mental health, we would like to help her focus on alternative activities she can participate in despite her asthma. Charlotte's parents must actively contribute to her health care. The family has difficulty understanding medication administration, function, and side effects. The mother's concerns made it evident that the family needed education on disease management and medication options that are pertinent to their daughter. We established Charlotte's medication protocol, gave oral hygiene and dietary guidance, and provided reassurance. To conclude, social de determinants of health were found to be important factors in asthma management in the interprofessional case. A care plan worked towards improving access to health care, reducing exposure to environmental factors, educating the patient and family, minimizing finances, and offering social support. These are our references. Any questions? Hey, okay, well, we are ready for any questions. We can close and um, close down and open the floor to some questions and and I would love folks who were um whose presentation was to introduce yourselves um, unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves to the group and uh, let's see who are members of the team I know Elise you were there <laughs> so um please introduce yourselves and then we'll start asking a few questions hi I'm Elise I'm a fourth year dental student Hi, everyone. I'm Darina Shannon, and I'm a first-year grad student uh, with the dietetics program at UNE. I'm Kylie, and I am a second-year physical therapy student at UNE. I'm Sarah, and I'm a nursing student at UNE. 
So um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'd rather open the floor to you to see um, if anybody would like to ask this team some questions. All righty then, I will start. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm really interested about your takeaways, what you learn about and from each other. I noticed uh, that you mentioned social work in there and the function of social work, but what what did you really learn from each other in working with a case that involved a child with asthma and the needs of, of uh, her family? I think we learned to be good listeners, first and foremost. Uh, I think when we were meeting ahead of time, we had a very structured agenda of the questions we wanted to ask and uh, what we wanted to find out from uh, the patient's family. However, when we actually met with mom during the first meeting and then dad in the second meeting, it became very clear that we needed to restructure <laughs> ourselves and just sit back and listen to what the parents had to say. Um, so it took some patience and it took flexibility on our part to adjust and see, depending on what we hear, how we can best uh, provide patient-centered care, depending on what the most pertinent issues and needs for that family were. Great. So really learning from the patients about what their needs were was a really critical step. Anyone Absolutely. else want to comment on one of your takeaways or what you learned about each other? I think also just finding the balance because we each have our own profession and we have so much to add to this patient case, but then finding the balance of what we can contribute and things that maybe we can pull back a little bit so our other teammates can also add what they have to contribute. I, I, I love that. That was great. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I'm just curious, what was... um. What was it, what surprised you the most about this um, about about your your work in the simulation with this with this family or about the teamwork? I can answer that, I guess. Um, I think my biggest surprise was that the roles of each um, healthcare provider weren't as clear cut as I initially would have thought. Um, I initially kind of thought it would be like each area of medicine would kind of apply to one profession. And it would all work together like that, but it was more interconnected and everyone was kind of working together and everyone had something to say on each point from like a slightly different perspective. So it's much more, um, much more flexible than I initially expected in the teamwork aspect. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone else want to speak to that? I, I also found that some of the um, different programs and disciplines overlapped like nutrition and dental were very similar yeah i'm really interested in in the dental aspect of this case because i i actually helped develop the case and i'm interested in what from an oral health perspective you might have taken away uh, it's definitely really important that the patient understands the side effects of certain medications um and different ways to prevent possibly other conditions that could be caused from medications yeah, and, and the family really didn't know that. So really important learning. Okay, well, I have more. What was the hardest thing? What was what was the hardest part of doing this together? Because everyone thinks, you know, you've been on a team, you played a sport, or you've been part of a debate society, or, you know, what was the hardest part for you? I would say time management. There was such a short amount of time for each scenario. It was really difficult for us to fit in everything that we wanted to within that amount of time. And for me, I would say the hardest thing was trying to find my role as a dietitian in that case and how I could be best helpful um, given all the, the things that are going on in that family's life, um, how what I have to say could be useful and applicable to Charlotte. So, Darina, what did you find out was because nutrition seems to be critically important in, in this family situation. What did you find out your role was? Yeah, so I came in very determined that the family could be greatly helped by, you know, giving some ideas and thoughts about, you know, smaller meals, more frequent meals, uh, increasing uh, vitamin D, magnesium, um, 
However, <laughs> as I was ready to deliver that big spiel, it seemed like the family had a change of heart or they they wanted to shift direction. So that definitely caught me off guard. And I wasn't able to say all that I wanted to say, but I had to check myself and realize that if that's not what the family wants to hear, and if they're hearing, you know, I think part of the issue was um, because of all those different difficult situations they were going through, they didn't see my role as somebody who's there to help. They saw me as somebody who was there to judge the wow. way they were feeding her daughter, yeah. their daughter. So that's when. I had to kind of shift gear and pass it on to Elise to talk about, you know, oral health um, and focus on more on that instead of uh, what Charlotte's actually eating. So to me, that was difficult to do. Yeah. So adaptability. I've just been told that it's time to move on. Thank you so much for your team work. You did a great job. Um, thanks so much. Our next presentation is from folks who participated in the Ghana cross cultural cross cultural immersion. Hello, I'm Elson, and today I'm happy. Hello, I'm Elson, and today I'm happy to alongside my team members. Hello, I'm Elson, and today I'm happy to alongside my team members share our transformative service learning experience as part of the UNE cross cultural exchange program. Our student team consists of myself representing the public health program, Amy from nursing, and Kayla from osteopathic medicine. As part of a larger interdisciplinary team from UNE, our journey took us to the Sunni Chakarati in Ghana. Together, we collaborated with local community members and healthcare workers, working hand in hand to establish and operate pop up health clinics. In our collaborative efforts, we reached hundreds of patients across three communities, including conducting health screenings, providing medications, and consultations with various clinicians. Here's a snapshot from one of those clinics. Beyond clinical aspects, our team embodied core teamwork principles, including flexibility, respect for diverse perspectives, and problem solving, and a readiness to enhance the organization, and most importantly, improve patient care. So using effective communication was not only critical in making our workspace more efficient, but also providing patient education is of the utmost importance in medicine. During our time in Ghana, I was primarily working with an optometrist. I was surprised when I met a 14-year-old girl who was developing cataracts as this is a disease that typically affects older adults and sometimes infants in congenital cases. With a translator, I asked the child and her grandfather about her condition. They had seen a doctor a couple months prior and they were told that she needed surgery. Her grandfather asked me if it would be possible to get glasses for her instead. I asked him about their hesitations with surgery as I explained that this was the only way that her eye could be saved and that glasses would not prevent the damage that was occurring to her eye as the cataract developed. It was not the cost of the surgery that was the deterrent, but rather when the family was told that she needed surgery, they weren't given sufficient patient education. They were under the impression that her eye would be physically removed from her head and then re-implanted during surgery. We explained that this wasn't the case and that although with every surgery there are risks, that the risks were minimal in this case. The child and her grandfather were appreciative and thrilled to receive more information about her situation and actually ended up calling their local hospital then and there to make an appointment. I'm so grateful to have been a part of this experience as it demonstrated just how important it is to meet patients and their families where they're at and confirm understanding. Our biggest barrier that we faced while in Ghana was the communication barrier between us and our patients. We had incredible translators to help us with this, but not enough of them to go around. And so we had to get creative in order to ensure that all our patients were receiving the best possible care. Since participating in this program, I've been thinking a lot about ways to enhance the efficiency of our clinic and to keep our role going as healthcare advocates by educating the next group of students that attend on what went wrong and what went right so they can learn from our mistakes. We move things around at the clinic nearly every day in order to create the most efficient clinic we could. All of our roles and responsibilities melded together and created a type of teamwork that I've never experienced with other healthcare professionals. Our work is all intertwined. Hello, I'm Alpha. Three, there are risks as it demonstrated just how important it is to meet patients and their families where they're at and for them to go around. And so we had to get creative in order to ensure that all our patients were receiving the best possible care. Since participating in this program, I've been thinking a lot about ways to enhance the efficiency of our clinic and to keep our role going as healthcare advocates by educating the next group of students that attend on what went wrong and what went right so they can learn from our mistakes. We move things around at the clinic nearly every day in order to create the most efficient clinic we could.
All of our roles and responsibilities melded together and created a type of teamwork that I've never experienced with other healthcare professionals. Our work is all intertwined and by using our different healthcare experiences, we overcame any challenges by keeping an open mind and using collaborative communication and keeping our patients as a priority focus. Thank you and we look forward to your questions. Bravo, that was great. So Sorry about the technical issue. It happens. <laughs> So can those of you who are part of this project introduce yourself and then we'll open the floor to questions. Hi, I'm Kayla and I'm a second year medical student. Hi, I'm Allison and I'm a student in the Master of Public Health program. Hi, I'm Emmy and I am a senior nursing student. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I know for a fact that several of us have been on this journey to Ghana, and I would imagine that um, there are some questions out there. Um, but I'll ask the first question, um, which is, what did you learn from each other? And, and I love that you talked about it being a very different kind of teamwork and really learning and wanting to pass that on to the next group of students who go. So can you say a little bit about what you specifically learned about and from each other? I can start. Um, something that I at first was a little intimidated by, but grew to really love and appreciate was I was the only medical student there. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some so many different groups of so many people that had just fantastic um, different backgrounds and different perspectives. And something I really valued probably the most out of it was just seeing and talking with everyone and how to most efficiently set up the clinic so that we could see the most patients in the limited amount of time that we were there. Um, and everyone had fantastic ideas and everyone was just so willing to learn and wanting to learn from each other. I think it made just an incredible experience out of it. So for example, Allison um, had a lot of surveys that I think we can talk about soon. Um, but having her next to our intake station where we're taking vitals and just getting um, an assessment of how well English was understood due to um, a lack of translators. We could just immediately send over um, people who could understand English to Allison and other students performing surveys. So I really, really just enjoyed the openness and how everyone having different perspectives is just such a great way to make medicine work. Yeah, I agree with Kayla. Um, as a public health student and not necessarily a clinician, I wasn't sure about what our role was going to be. And it's hard to expect what it's going to be like going in, but it really impressed me about there was no um, like sense of something's below me. Everyone just jumped in whenever they needed to do. Um, even our faculty was amazing. I mean, they were in the same living conditions as us. They like, were there every step of the way. So it was really amazing to see that everyone, no matter what their role, was willing to jump in whenever necessary or um, possible. We have a yeah. question. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Going off of that, um, one thing that stood out for me was the work that the um, social work master's students did when they went to the school systems and they um we donated like a bunch of soccer balls and we donated a skeleton to one of the schools and there were all kinds of like period packs for the students and I just thought that work was super interesting and it was something that I hadn't really experienced before. Sorry to interrupt you there's a question in the chat from uh Dean Morton um asking about what did you learn from your Ghanaian colleagues about teamwork? I'll go first on that. Um, so with me, with public health, I um, was helping out wherever I could. And then I also did some surveys to understand more about malaria in the community. So I worked with interpreters and it took maybe like the first couple of days of working with an interpreter to kind of like assess our roles. So I think at first it felt almost like they were like working for, for us, but I really wanted to break that down and like show that we're working as a team. And if they have suggestions on how to make this better I was willing to hear it not just hear like we don't want to hear like oh you're doing a great job we want to be told what can we do better how can we streamline this how can we do better care so I think it was great by the end I think everyone is really on the same page about that there are a multitude of them but I think it's important for others to hear something that um I struggled bit with a little bit was um kind of disregarding some medicine that I had learned as like a factual, like 
obviously there's black and white, like, yes and no answers sometimes in medicine, but a lot of the time there's so many different ways of thinking about things um, and accepting um, views, especially from like churches about medicine and trying to integrate their strong beliefs and things that really keep them going mm -hmm. while making sure that their health is also met um, and respecting the patients along the way, but also um, just giving information that we learned as advice while, yeah, it was a balance. Say. Right. And I would just add that we follow the Ghana Health Service clinical practice guidelines over there. And so some of their evidence isn't necessarily our best evidence. So um, there's compromise right. and, yeah. and we're guests. And, and sadly, so we need to really important. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, D. Morton, but we have to move on. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for an amazing presentation. And we will go on to the next. We need a whole day for this. Our topic is secondary transition resources across New England. A question that's often asked is what secondary transition programs exist in order for students seamless integration into adulthood, equipping them with the tools to navigate the complexities of life beyond school? And this question was our foundation for figuring out what we wanted our project to be about. So my name is Hannah Liberty. I'm a junior health, wellness, and occupational studies major, and I have a special education minor. Uh, my name is Michaela O'Meara. I'm a senior health, wellness, and occupational studies uh, major with a concentration in assistive technology. I'm Morgan Bassett. I'm a junior special education major and elementary education doesn't. I'm Olivia Hamm. I'm a junior special education major with a minor in mental health rehabilitation. Our faculty member is Karen Hussman. Um, she's the associate clinical professor and director, Department of Health Promotion Studies health, wellness, and occupational studies. So our objective for this project was the world of secondary transition can be overwhelming for families and students alike. Lots of individuals do not know where to start when it comes to resources available. This makes it difficult for them to utilize all of the services that they might have. Um, our website is important because it complies with a variety of resources in each New England state to make the process more digestible for those families and students affected by it. So our website is set up. Um, so this is the home page. It's a secondary transition resources. Uh, each one of these boxes, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island are the states in New England. Um, and they each link right to the pages. So then the links are also on the side. So you can reach any state. And then within each state, we focus it on the services provided in the state, employment resources, advocacy resources, transportation transportation, health and wellness, housing, community, and funding. All those resources and each one of those links is included in each state. So then the state pages are set up similarly to our homepage where each one of these buttons is a link right to the page. So if you click right on Rhode Island, you don't have to go down and click any of the side links. You can click them right uh, from the homepage. And then each one of our state pages contains a little fact about individuals with disabilities in each state, um, and then it has a figure, and then each resource contains an icon or company logo, uh, the name of the resource, uh, easy access link, and a little description, a brief description of what the resource entails, and then the front page or the home page of each one of our states has all the resources, and then each link is uh, divided into the resources for that. Uh, we learned that um, when the resource is specifically important for individuals with disabilities um, as they transition through um, adulthood and independence are important because when individuals transition from high school and living at home to obtaining their own residence and, um, and jobs, they're often um, a loss of supports and lack of information to learn um, about new sources and that can be overwhelming. Um, and then through, or the project relates to our interprofessional honors distinction um, through the um, because through um, teamwork, roles and responsibilities, and communication, and, and we utilize those things um, a lot through the creation of this project. Um, by working together, we should affect the communication, role setting, um, and teamwork um, from yeah, the completion of our website. Well, thank you. I want to take note that you are one of the few fully undergraduate 
presentations we have. So thank you so much for that. And um, would anyone uh, let introduce yourselves first mm -hmm. and so we can meet the team. Um, and then we'll ask you some questions. Hi, my name's Hannah. Um, I'm a junior Hawass major. Great. Um, I'm Michaela. I'm a senior Hawass major. Okay. I'm Morgan. I'm a junior uh, special education and elementary education double major. Great. I'm Olivia, and I'm a special education major with a minor in mental health rehabilitation. Nice. So wonderful to have you all here. And um, I'm going to wait and see if anyone else wants to ask a question because we're getting shorter and shorter on time. Um, who has a question? Well, I guess I will ask a question and I seem to be a lead on this. Um, so what you learn from each other? What, what, you know, you're working together as an interprofessional team. This is an amazing project um, and a really, really useful project. But I'm interested in what you learn for each other from each other and what was hard. Was there anything that was hard? I'll go first. So I think I really learned a lot from this project. Um, we actually started it last, we were trying to figure out, we think it was really early last spring semester. And it basically the hardest part for us, I think, was just coming up with a timeline. Um, we had like a really strong idea of what we wanted to create and just the aspect of actually putting it into a physical form was probably just that big transition that we had to make. Um, but working together with everyone was really good and easy. We all had um, very different perspectives that we came from that honestly really seamlessly overlapped, which was really great. Um, especially with working on this project. Yeah, I can jump in too. Um, I would say learning from each other. I think it really helped deciding what kind of resources we were going to include in our um, website, just because I feel like from the educational standpoint, I was looking more towards, you know, educational, secondary education, um, maybe college opportunities, but then the HOWAS majors kind of brought in those extra pieces of information that maybe I wouldn't have thought about. So that was really helpful to kind of have all of our expertise put together into one. So, um, Steve, you had a question in the in the chat. Would you like to ask it? Sorry about that. Yeah, I just am interested in knowing whether or how um, your interdisciplinary uh, team involvement may have changed your career paths. I think for me, maybe it didn't necessarily change my career path or what I wanted to do, but it really opened my eyes up to the way that, like, I know now that I can work with people in other professions, like for the HOWAS majors, maybe if they're going into OT or PT, I've learned like how they have a very different perspective and that could be really valuable for making goals for my students in the future. Yeah, I would agree with Olivia. I think that um, through working with um, education, special education uh, majors, um, I think I realized that we kind of all have the student in mind when we're working with them as as um, practitioners in a school. Um, and I think that was really important. And I think that would maybe change how I practice in the future. Well, yeah, I mean, I the, the other thing that really came through for for me in in watching you do this process is um, the, the passion you had for um, helping with people with disabilities to transition um, into adulthood or into next steps after school. So, um, I just wonder if you learned anything about that further or learned how you could work together to accomplish a seamless transition. Um, I think as far as finding resources go, I think that there's way more out there than I had originally thought that there were. And so I think like, it was really important to kind of compile them all in one place, um, to kind of ease that process for a lot of people. Um, I think I definitely knew that like what to do, like parts of what to do to help a student transition outside of like high school, going into like an independent lifestyle. But I didn't know there were so many resources out there. And I think probably a lot of other people don't know about that too, which is why the website will be really useful for them. I was just going to add also that as an education major, I don't think that I always considered that um, OT or PT or those other specialties in the school system could help with a situation like this. Um, so I think it was really helpful to open my eyes that, you know, those people in my future career in the school system, I can reach out to help um, and they will have ideas as well. And it's not all on the teacher to help the student. Something I just want to add about that. Um, I'm going to add the link to our website into the chat of this meeting um, so that if you guys all want to take the time to look at it, we'd really greatly appreciate that. Um, it's 
honestly a great resource and there are so much more out there um but we took the time and we found as many as we could um kind of like everyone's been saying there's so many out there that we didn't even realize could be out there um especially from that last year of um the school district to that first year of no longer having those um, kind of supports that the town or district put in place. Um, that big transition from having a lot of supports to not having those directly given to you um, is a big change. Um, and this was kind of our way of trying to bridge that gap. So I'm going to add that. Thank you. That's wonderful. It's a, you know, it's not a population that people think about as much as they should in the transition from being in a school, an elementary or high school situation to being out in the big world. So you have created, you're advancing uh, knowledge and resources, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, anyone else have questions? I know, Kelly, we have what, about a minute? One minute. Who would love to have that one minute? Anything the team would like to say that that we haven't covered yet? What one last remark from from you folks about what was the best thing about this project? I think for me, the best part about doing this project was knowing that I'm helping adults and maybe parents of children's children with disabilities to have a resource to go to if they need help with the transition, which just feels really good. Well, that's a great final comment. Thank you so much, team. You did a fabulous job on a very important area. Thank you. And can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Today we're going to be presenting on a case study on type 2 diabetes. Bob Murphy is a 65 year old retired truck driver from Millinocket, Maine. And he came to the office complaining of trouble with his vision and had a tingling feeling in his feet <clears throat> that made him feel unsteady. Bob has worked as a cross-country truck driver for the past 40 years and mentioned that he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes five years ago while on the road, but has not been able to change his fast food diet or sedentary lifestyle due to the demands of the job. This is the first time he is seeking care since that diagnosis and since from retiring from trucking last year. Now that he's retired, Bob has been able to play more golf with his friends and still struggles to improve his fast food and four beers at night diet. Bob says that he does not understand what having diabetes means and the has thought that his symptoms were related to his older age. He wants to know what he can do so that he can continue to golf with his friends. This is a framework that looks at all the aspects from Bob's life uh, in the health and behavioral factors to the demographic and socioeconomic influences. Some of these factors, such as his diet and lack of understanding his diagnosis, are directly feeding into his uncontrolled diabetes, while others, such as having health insurance, a stable housing environment, and better exercise routine, reduce the risk of diabetes progressing. Working with Bob, we hope to provide interventions and a treatment plan that aim to expand upon the factors that reduce his diabetes progression while lessening the factors that promote his diabetes. The interventions and resources we provide Bob are to help and support and educate him about his type 2 diabetes, uh, about the symptoms and what he can do to slow the disease progression. Thrive Penobscot is an organization that is based out of Millinocket, Maine. Their goal is to provide a host of resources to older individuals suffering from chronic diseases. They also have many transportation services, in-house assistance and support, food resources, and they also help with scheduling medical appointments. Through his Medicare plan, Bob would qualify and benefit from this resource. Additionally, we would have him enrolled in the diabetes education program at Millinocket Regional Hospital, where a diabetes nurse educator and dietitian would help Bob one-on-one -on -one to manage his diabetes while creating a diet plan to help him with what food to incorporate or reduce in his diet. In addition to these programs, we want to emphasize the importance of exercise and reducing the symptoms and progression of type 2 diabetes. Bob, in addition to golfing, can also start to utilize nearby trails in the Katahdin Pride Park or Kermit Crandall Park. Bob can also get senior discounts at the local YMCA and Medway Recreational Complex, which offer a host of low impact classes. These are just a few of the many resources and ideas we have lined up for Bob. We hope to continue offering these to him in future follow-up visits to support him in adapting a healthier lifestyle in order to manage his diabetes so that he can continue to do the activities he loves with friends. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, 
who are the members of the team who are here from this project. And this is a fit project. Um, so can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Aiden Regan. I am a first year pharmacy student. Welcome, Aiden. And who else is here? And I'm here as well. I'm Maddie Powers. I'm a second year comm student right now. And then who you guys heard talking through the project was our third team member, David, who won't be here today. So. Okay, great. Well, I, I'd like to start with um, maybe asking you a little bit about your paradigm, because it's very clear you have a model that you're working from. So it would be really helpful, I think, for all of us to, to know a little bit more about that and how it intersects with interprofessional um, working and practice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, so we all came from, we're a part of the PHIT program. And so we were, our assignment basically for this semester was to create a case from scratch um, and to kind of make it a personable experience that we're kind of creating this person and we're deciding what resources they have, as well as kind of what's going on with them in terms of disease progression. Um, and I really enjoyed kind of doing this project. Sorry for the background noise. I'm at a cafe that I just got to. Um, but I really enjoyed it because they pushed us to go beyond pharmaceuticals, which I think is always kind of medicine's first line and to really kind of delve into like, what is going on with this man beyond medicine and what is his social life? What is his environment like? Um, so that's kind of why we approached our interventions in a more holistic way in a less pharmaceutical way as to give him resources that can actually work for him in his environment that he is in. Yeah, I, I liked how we considered all the factors in his life, not just like what kind of medications he has to take. I think when you consider all the factors, you can help people a lot more. So Aiden, as a pharmacy student, was that a challenge? Oh, yeah, it was definitely still a challenge. I mean, I'm still very new to healthcare. I, I was a, a math major in my undergrad, so I'm kind of learning as I go. But yeah, it was definitely challenging. Great. I'm just curious, who who do you think was missing from your team? You know, what other provider would you have liked to have to consult with around this case? Yeah, definitely. I think this is actually something we brought up to our leader and that we would have loved to have some type of social worker, dietitian, just another grad student that maybe has more of that, not even perspective, but also like resources that they could help us with. Because in the end, what we did was kind of broke it up with each other and we're like, what programs can we find that are all encompassing for this patient that we've created? Um, and like we did find really great resources that I honestly had no idea even existed. And it's that Thrive Penobscot program would have really encompassed all of this gentleman's problems and been a resource and support for him. But I think, yeah, even having like nursing perspectives, social care perspectives, um, I think would have helped us just kind of have a better perspective as to what other resources can be out there for patients that we'd be seeing in the office. I was surprised at how many resource, resources there were available to him, despite the rural area that he lives in. Which is really important. And also sometimes in rural areas, of course, there's a challenge to finding those kinds of resources. So I want to build on your, your comment, Maddie, and say and ask you, you know, before you did this project, would you have thought in this kind of broader other professional kind of way, or was this project instrumental in shifting your paradigm? Um, I think I've had a unique experience where I had some time in between undergrad and medical school, and I also minored in anthropology, specifically medical anthropology, where we got that idea of like caring for a human beyond what medicine dictates. Um, so I knew I wanted to get involved with this interprofessional project to see what other resources um, like those dietitians or social workers had in their back pockets. And of course, kind of ended up with two medical students and a farm student. But again, like I think having that on us to actually go out and search for actual realistic resources, that's what kind of expanded my knowledge as to what's available for patients beyond what I can do myself. And that emphasis of like collaboration amongst, you know, different interprofessional roles. But 
it was very interesting to kind of delve deep and really find those resources for this patient. Yeah, I, have, I agree with everything Maddie said. It was a fun experience. So Christina, I see you had a question in the chat. Would you like to ask her, or at least you have a comment in the chat. Would you like to um, ask it or say it? Hi, yeah, no, you know, Honestly, I was just commenting, um, Aiden, you were referring to other factors that contribute to overall care and how you might advise or make recommendations. Um, you know, and as a, as a uh, public health practitioner, I can say that this is, this is the whole point, right? Um, and I think often we're not reminded of the importance of bringing in this piece into the clinical atmosphere. Um, and it really is something that we need to be thinking about when we give overall patient care and how we use social determinants of health and other aspects um, and factors into making recommendations, particularly those that are sustainable for medication needs, dietary needs, et cetera. Um, I was um, thinking about what Aiden talked about, about working in a rural community. And I was wondering if that... Um... And that was particularly salient for you in this project or what you learned from thinking about resources in a rural community. So so you're asking if that's something I, I might consider doing in my future? Was that the um, question? Um, perhaps, I guess the question was more, um, I, well, many many of our students aren't from rural communities. So thinking right. about accessing healthcare in a rural community, what did you learn anything from that aspect of the case? Well, like I said before, I learned that, I mean, at least in, in Millinocket, where this gentleman lives, there are a lot of resources, even if we don't think there are. Like, it's, it's, it's easier to find help than people might think. Maybe, you know, we have assumptions that need to be examined, right, um, before we, you know, we need to discover what's out there. Maddie, did you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say, so like I actually chose the setting of Millinocket because that was, I'm from Massachusetts, Boston area, which is, you know, polar opposite. And some of my classmates up here were saying that they lived in Millinocket without, you know, you know, electricity for a long time. And so that was why I was like, wanted to pose this as a challenge for us to put this guy in what we think to be a rural community, but also see that once we delve into this rural community of Millinocket, mean that there are resources out there for this specific gentleman, which I think is beyond necessary because that Thrive Penobscot program we had mentioned as like a interventional care, like their number one goal is to provide resources, whether that be from food to shopping, to getting to your healthcare appointments, to getting a good diet, all with the goal of helping you know, older folks in the community with a chronic progressive disease, which was like very exciting to see that that was a program. And I wish that was like even more outspoken in cities. Um, so that was a really interesting thing for us to kind of have this Millinocket setting, but then delve really deep into the actual resources there and see that there are things that we can be giving patients beyond just our care in office, as well as, um, you know, educating the patient as to the resources they can access themselves and what they can be doing on their own time type of thing. So we have about what a minute or one minute to go and then the final slide. I just if you can say in one minute, how did you come to develop your case? And did you do it together collaboratively, the three of you? Yeah, this has kind of been going on the whole semester and it just kind of started with what's your case, who's your person, what disease do they have? And then after meeting and meeting where it's like, let's find actual resources. So um, it was a great experience, I think. And I think we've all learned a lot, not only just working on this case, but like working together across interprofessional roles, as well as like divvying up team responsibilities. Um, so it was, a, it was a great experience through and through. Kelly, did you want to add anything? So I just wanted to mention that I have uh, dropped in the chat um, a couple of times the QR code um, and the link to please uh, go follow that link and record your attendance at this event. Um, it can uh, count toward your IP distinctions, honors distinction um, application. 
Well, thank you both. And thank you all of you who have hung in here for this whole time. You students, you are amazing, absolutely amazing. And it makes me feel very hopeful for the healthcare of the future. And um, we wish you all the best. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to give an introduction. This is uh, Team One, the Lifesavers, happens to be my team that I was an advisor to, so I'm very proud of all the work that was done here. And uh, this team is going to be presenting on asthma and the social determinants of health. And this work was done as part of the IPTI, or Interprofessional Team Immersion Experience, this past fall. So let's take it away. Team one looked at the social determinants of health and how they can be barriers to treatment. So we broke this down into five categories, which are the five categories of the social determinants of health, healthcare access, the neighborhood, economic status, social, and education access. Um, the three of us who are presenting broke it down into our different perspectives. So the social work perspective um, worked to communicate with the school and helped um, communicate the whole team and be a familiar face. We looked at the environment, emotional health, and the resources. The registered dietitian perspective looked at the environment, the health, health literacy, and food, access to food, and the quality of food. Um, from the OT perspective, they really dove into Charlotte's daily routines. What are they? How are they impacting her ability um, to manage her asthma? What, what what happening, what's happening that's increasing her symptoms versus decreasing her symptoms, the impact of all the recent transitions um, and how Charlotte's handling them, adaptations for when the new baby arrives and everybody's role in the family changes, medication management, and the environment. Um, recommendations from our team, pharmacy recommended a spacer for her inhaler, stopping Benadryl and stopping Singular, and then adding melatonin. Nutrition recommended stopping the supplements that they were using already due to the cost and the worsening of Charlotte's condition. Um, they added in a children's multivitamin and then suggested to Mr. Soto about a website called Budget Bites to help him make quick, easy meals. Social work recommended therapy, um, prescription programs like GoodRx and EBT for groceries. Occupational therapy recommended making visual schedules for their daily tasks and routines, as well as Charlotte's medication management. And medical recommended getting labs done like CMP, CDC, and A1C. And dentistry recommended baking soda and a biotin gel for her teeth due to um, the thrush from a medication. So our team's takeaways, this is what we feel is most important. What did we learn here together as a team? Um, so we learned that we only want to send in a few people at a at, the, at a time to not overwhelm the patient. We um, could have been a little bit more action oriented and had an agenda, a set amount of time for recommendations and then a set of amount of time for interventions. Um, it was really important to incorporate the feedback from the family um, to collaborate them and check in with them about the feasibility of the plan, how this could really work for them in their lives. Um, reviewing um, and following up from the first session to the second session, especially with the addition of Mr. Soto, and then having a point person throughout. And then the realization that no one of us could have solved this, this situation ourselves. Really working collaborative, collaboratively, we could work with the social determinants of health impacting Charlotte um, to kind of give her the best care within, within you know, working together as a, as a team. Awesome, guys. Thank you for sharing. So for those of you who have not done IPTI, I guess I'm going to ask the, um, the presenting team, could you give us a quick like two minute description of what was going on with the case that you were asked to deal with this this semester? Tr Trudy, you want to take yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so in terms of this case, um, we looked at, you know, it was pediatrics with asthma and I think that everyone, given their different backgrounds, had something to contribute. So, you know, we tried from the first session, I think we sent, set the foundation and groundwork to kind of suss out, like, what was this case really about? And of course, there were more questions than answers, I think, when we got, before we got to the second uh, session. And so, there, because at the end of the first session, then there was more discussion about nutrition specifically. So that's when I came in for the second session to 
to kind of suss that out and f figure out what was going on with that because that was ended, added at the end. But like Mackenzie said in the in our presentation, and I think we all sort of agreed that um, having this sort of continuity from session one to session two really would have made like tied it together a lot better. And um, having, but she was you know a constant in those sessions too, which did help for continuity and did help for consistency. So her being there was great. Um, but if we had basically asked less questions and came up with more of an action plan and try to discuss it with them instead of kind of fitting it in at the end or as, you know, as much as we could, where it's like, okay, here's uh, what you're supposed to do at the end, you know? So, yeah. Great. So it sounds like there's a lot of learning on how to manage. A, uh, like, I'll just say this was a super complex case. Do you all agree? Um, I think uh, everybody wanted extra time to be able to just keep gathering information. And I think one of the big takeaways the team had, as you suggested, was that um, sometimes when you have so many different lenses, there's so much information, it's hard to then like put it all together and come up with a single plan that's unified um, and not just these individual things from each profession. So definitely a learning experience there. Um, let's see, does anybody um, in the group have any questions about um, the experience that they had in IPTI in general? I just wanted to also add, I was very happy that this is going on while I was also doing my motivational interviewing class. So this was very helpful to have this coincide together. It was like perfect timing. So I was like, great, I get to use my MI, more practice. Cause I mean, if there was, if one of these events was specifically just motivational interviewing, I would love that. And I think everybody else would too, especially um, in the nutrition program. I don't know how, how often motivational interviewing is used outside of nutrition. So, but I think that it would be useful just to have more of that patient experience and the feedback. The feedback from the actors was super useful um, because they we don't really get that from patients. Like, you know, I'm doing my clinicals and I don't get any, the, the patient says what they say, but they don't like, oh, by the way, that was not good or this. Um, you know, my preceptor might say something, but the patient doesn't say anything, so. Great feedback, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, how, what, what was the hardest or best thing that you encountered when working as a team? I think the best thing that came out of working as a team was to see everybody's different perspective and to see us grow throughout the process. Um, I think the hardest thing was, you know, we each had our own like set of questions per our own lens and trying to kind of fit those all in. And I think that's kind of what we learned as a result of the process about how we could work more collaboratively and as a team and to how do we like have a set amount of time to ask questions and then leave aside a period of time um, to speak about our interventions and recommendations and then how that lands with the patient. So I think that's one of the best things um, that we got out of it was just like learning more how to collaborate more effectively. Um, and just a quick, can you guys introduce yourselves and tell us which professions you're from? We heard Trudy's Nutrition, right? I'm Mackenzie, um, Mackenzie Hitch. I'm in the social work program, second year. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so then the last question I have for you guys, um, thinking about IPD and the experience of being put all together. Um, when, what did you, what do you think you learned about other professions that you maybe didn't know or what sort of myths or maybe assumptions did you discover you, you had and then you realized that um, they either weren't true or you had a, misconception of what a, another profession did um I didn't know a ton about physical therapy I'll, I'll admit like I think my I've had very limited experience in for example like in clinical um I did long-term care so that was my only exposure to physical therapy and basically or I'm sorry not physical therapy occupational therapy <laughs> so totally different um, yeah, so occupational therapy, I think, is almost a misnomer in a way, because when you think of it, you think it has to pertain to someone's job or like work that they do, and it, do it doesn't really. Um, so it's it's on par with physical therapy, but it's different, and it, it, it encompasses a lot more than I thought, um, but I don't really experience that 
in any of my clinical rotations or anything. So that's why I wasn't super familiar with it. But I see the value uh, having worked with Katie in our group, like what she's she was bringing to the table. And I don't feel like she got to utilize it as much because of the time constraints and so many people. But I think it was valuable to have the different disciplines working together. Awesome. Well, last thoughts, Mackenzie, we have about a minute left. Additionally, I was surprised by occupational therapy. I didn't realize how much overlap it has with social work. Um, and social work has a very wide scope. There are many different ways somebody can be a social worker, um, but it kind of, yeah, overlapped with like, how can we make everything a little bit more functional? How can we make it smooth uh, process of whether that's coming up with a routine for medication or, or meals? Um, so there's a lot there that overlapped. I, didn't know a ton about occupational therapy prior. I agree. And one of the, one of the things I saw as a facilitator was um, when, when the team kind of broke and the, the patients got to say their, their statement, even though she only had a few minutes, um, the, they, they offered such important and concrete suggestions for that that family that the family was really appreciative and I thought that was just like a should have to shine well thank you both for presenting I really appreciate it I hope everybody here has a better kind of insight into what IPTI was like this semester um, we're going to transition now to one of the mini grants which I'm kind of excited about because I know nothing about these um, so this mini grant is exploring interprofessional education and social determinants of health in the social determinants of health month. And um, we'll go ahead and start the video and let's see what they've got to share with us. Hi all, I'm Allison Gazzetti. I'm an OMS2 with SPSR. This is our project on social determinants of health month with an interprofessional approach to education. This slide represents our collaborators and their credentials are all listed below. Today, we're representing Unicom and the Occupational Therapy Program. Our initiative was to create a month that expanded more than previous years to more interprofessional programs and also outreach to our national chapter. Our intention was to have honest conversation about biases that we may hold in order to better serve our communities. All the topics discussed centered around accessibility, health disparities, how to evoke change, and how to improve health outcomes. Hi, I'm Kylie Robin. I'm a second year medical student with SPSR. The goals of this month were to include as many interprofessional programs as possible. We wanted to engage with a large audience to guide their understanding of the importance of social determinants of health within their respective healthcare fields. Students throughout the month were provided with resources and virtual learning opportunities to supplement our curriculum. Additionally, we engage with our community to best fit their needs and better understand our role within this complex system. Hi, I'm Amal and I'm OMS2 on the SPSR eBoard. In total, we had 21 events from 15 different clubs and organizations. The events that are starred are the ones that were interprofessional, although all the online and Zoom events were open to all campuses and professions. Our newest addition to events this year was our collaboration with the National Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Hi, I'm Caitlin Clicky. I'm a second year medical student. I'm a part of IPSG. For our interprofessional collaboration, we worked with CAIEP, PSR, COTAD, and IPSG, as well as respective clubs uh, who worked to notify the student population of their upcoming events. Conversations and events were hosted by DOs, MDs, MSWs, NPs, MPHs, and OTDs, and had contributions from students from a variety of different programs and disciplines. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm a second year medical student with SPSR and IPSG. Um, for attendance, we had a 19 people, 119 people complete the attendance survey, all of whom were comm students and faculty. There were several professions that plan and contributed to events throughout the month, including OT, dental, and pharmacy. However, they did not have attendance surveys available. Our average rating for events was a 9.74 out of 10. Students provided comments about the events. For example, quote, I got to discover the fuel for my colleagues' passions, end quote. My name is Mikhail Svensson and I'm a second year occupational therapy student and part of IPSG. Our biggest limitation we faced was the difficulty connecting with other student groups on the Portland campus. We would also like to be more adamant on collecting attendance surveys. For our future plans, we will increase marketing of events to the Portland campus. We intend to dedicate time towards the end of the events for survey purposes and hope to continue to build connections with other graduate healthcare professionals. 
Thank you all so much for making this month possible. And here's a photo from our kickoff event below. And thank you, everyone. Awesome, guys. Very cool stuff. I'm psyched. I didn't know about half of all of that that took place. So, I mean, I'm sure I did because I got all the emails. Um, but that's really exciting. Uh, thank you guys for sharing that. Um, I'd like to actually, I have two questions. My first one is just, what does SPSR stand for? <laughs> Yes. So it stands for um, Student Physicians for Social Responsibility. We actually have a national chapter that I believe started in around the 40s. It's uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. They did a lot of work with um, kind of like anti-war and redistributing money towards uh, more healthcare programs. So each state usually has a chapter. And we have an executive director through PSR Maine that we work with as students that connects us to a wide database of physicians around the state that kind of hold the same values that we do and are willing to come talk to students, uh, do outreach and, and things like that. Cool. Thank you for sharing. I did not know anything about that organization. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, um, you said one of your challenges was connecting with other student groups. What do you think would make that easier? So we talked a little bit about this. Um, so since we're on the Biddeford campus as comm students, a lot of our events obviously happen on the Biddeford campus. And what CAPE really suggested is that we had a Zoom component to all of our events this year, which is something that we didn't have last year. Um, but I think the location sometimes makes it a little bit harder in order to connect to students. This is the first year we worked with Caitlin, which is IPSG, um, and Lauren, who can't be here today, but they allowed us to connect with more student groups, and I think more transparency in who connects with who and kind of um, what who leads what program would really help us in the future. Um, we did try to connect with GAPSA, um, and we did a lot of outreach to like one-on-one -on -one contacts that CAPE gave us, but, uh, I think it's really the location and once COM moves to Portland, I think there'll be more opportunities for us to connect and collaborate as a whole, but yeah, if you guys have any additional thoughts or opinions, um, as like my team, but I think it's really location-based. Are there ways, do you think that, um, you know, we could design, you know, you guys are coming up um, and that's super exciting. So what might be ways to facilitate student collaboration? You guys are all, and this is like for anybody that's in this, you know, breakout room, like, please like join in the conversation. What have been successful ways that you've collaborated with other students? What would you guys love to see? I mean, I know that um, I would love like a more, uh, kind of like diverse set of events, because obviously we'll still keep having Social Determinants of Health Month. This is our fourth year. Um, and I think actually just being physically in a space all together and facilitating conversations is really a great way to to learn about these, because obviously, you know, we had um, nurse practitioners give uh, talks, but it was a majority of comm students. So it would be nice to have some NPs in the audience that can give a, a diverse perspective on things. So I think just the physical aspect. Um, since it was interprofessional, did any professions that joined you guys, like, can you speak to what that brought to the experience by having other professions present? I think their um, perspective and um, just experience really brought a lot to these different events. You know, like we can only go so far as students um, and we can only go so far as like physicians and being able to talk with nurses and talk with social workers and talk with the community at large was just really valuable in kind of bringing new perspectives and allowing us to kind of explore the thoughts and feelings of our community. Mm -hmm. Did anything stick out? What What's your like, you guys had a memory of social determinants of health month. What, what, what do each of you have as your, your memory? I think one of my like um, more memorable experiences was we had a um, discussion about mass incarceration and we actually had um, a currently incarcerated individual and a prior incarcerated individual come to campus and like speak basically straight from the heart about their 
experiences and the difficulties of like having a family and being in these really tense situations and how they're kind of growing and changing from it. And it's just so amazing to hear their strength and to hear their, um, their kind of mental fortitude to kind of make it through it. And it was just so, um, I don't know, enlightening about the situation. You know, like I didn't even realize what was going on until we had that opportunity here on campus. Awesome. Anyone else want to share? We have about one minute left. I want one more good memory. Amal? You yeah, I was going to say, I think the inner perf- the kickoff event was probably my favorite memory. Um, I think that because of the distance from the Portland campus, it is probably difficult for um, the other interprofessional students to have joined. Um, but I think in the future, it would be so great to have that be like, I, I could definitely feel the excitement for the month in that event. Um, and I think if there were other professionals present, it would have been an even greater event um, because it was like a very good showcase of like community. And um, there were like questions on the tables that people could ask one another to look forward to the coming month. Um, so I was like, it is such a great event and I'm looking forward to it becoming even greater in the future. Awesome, that sounds exciting. All right, I got. I think I have time for one more, one more memory. Somebody give me one more. I really loved learning about COTAD, which I didn't previously know about. It's the um, Coalition of Occupational Therapy Advocates for Diversity. I thought that was super cool. Um, so Michaela is actually a part of that, and she introduced us to that. And to have this like cool physician organization of PSR and then kind of COTAD do this like great collaboration all together. It was really wonderful. And then I think a big event that sticks out to me that we also did was um, it was mental health among Asian Americans with a MSW uh, associate director kind of leading this conversation about working with immigrants and refugees on mental health and, and substance treatment. I thought that was a really, uh, it was a new event that we had this year. And I thought that it was just, it was super awesome to get that clinical social worker perspective. Yeah, I think anytime somebody brings a clinical perspective into the classroom, okay. it's always valuable. So much of our classroom stuff is focused on like notes and books and t- content, right? But we know life is an experience. Um, and so, you know, having those shared experiences is just like such a powerful way to do learning. So that's that's awesome. Thank you guys for sharing that. That's that's it sounds like it was a great month. I'm really excited that you had such great collaborations across the board and sounds like it'll be even more exciting when everyone's up in Portland all together. That's wonderful. All right, so we are going to transition to our next group, which is the inaugural IP reproductive health cohort. I'm very excited about this. Um, We've had... I heard there was a lot of pharmacy students in this cohort, and I'm just like totally jazzed to learn about what they did in this um, cohort. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait and just make sure that we have everybody from the live stream here with us. Um, And it does look like we are ready to go. So let's go ahead and start that video. Hello, everyone. We are presenting a poster titled Inaugural IP Reproductive Health Cohort meets community need through partnership, education, and awareness, making a case for deepening reproductive curricula across IP education. I'm here today with three students of the Reproductive Health Leadership Program. Thanks so much, Kathleen. So the purpose of this interprofessional poster really aimed to look at the year-over-year outcomes in the proposed planning for last year and this year's mini-grant funded generously provided by Kate. We are also describing the need that was met last year, and we wanted to talk about menstrual equity writ large in the state of Maine, highlight the process, potential improvements, and talk about what was going on at UNE across IP curriculum. So why this is important, currently in the United States, people who menstruate spend about $20 on menstrual products per month, which is incredibly costly. 
when we think about this cost, people might say, well, where does this money come from? How, how am I going to pay for this? Maybe they can get it through their doctor's office or whatnot. This is incredibly time consuming. And when we looked at community partnerships, we saw that there were existing places, but they had lost their funding. We wanted to help meet this need. And we also wanted to be incredibly sensitive to cultural humility. We partnered with St. Elizabeth's Essential Pantry, and we really understood that a lot of folks who were having this need couldn't purchase this product with SNAP funding. St. Elizabeth's averages 285 individuals per week. So the impact of our project, we were able to supply over 21,000 menstrual products to St. Elizabeth. Our donation could serve about up to 175 people for up to six months of menstrual cycles, and that can be depicted in the infographic right in the center. The lessons learned from a project like this are innumerable, but a couple of the key ones that we pulled in order to inform future years are one, that funding is crucial to keeping local organizations running. And therefore, not only will we, we be reapplying for the mini grant, but also looking at other potential grant funding, as well as partnerships with retailers and distributors to ask for donations, as well as listening to your community and their needs. Uh, this can be done by both looking at accessibility and potentially partnering with mobile pantries, such as Portland Food Pantry, as well as looking at inclusivity and making sure that the resources provided fit the needs of everyone, from trans inclusive packaging to culturally appropriate products. In closing, we hope this project can continue into next year's cohort, and a big thank you to the Reproductive Health Leadership Team and St. Elizabeth's Essentials Pantry. Wow. Awesome work. What an impact, guys. Welcome. Um, so I guess my, my first question to the presenters is, um, how did you find your community partner and how did partnering with that um, community partner inform sort of the direction you took with your work? What a great question. Thank you so much, Emily. We were actually also texting as we were watching the video. And, and um, so first and foremost, uh, one of the team members who's not on, on this call, um, Chester wouldn't mind us sharing this, but Anne, his mom, is part of the board of directors at St. Elizabeth's, and she's been an incredible community partner. I'm going to tag Kathleen to jump in, but um, Anne shared with us that we we probably safely underestimated how crucial our donation was. I'll, I'll say as a former fundraiser that we wanted to say that in case the monies ran out, in case we weren't able to, to jump in year over year. Austin's part of this second year of cohort but um, their funding had ran out. They didn't have a, a funder in the, the wings. We understand that we are so graciously funded by um, formerly CC, and so we wanted something that was sustainable. But because of the way that the cohort was organized in their first year, because Chester's mom was on this board, we, we had that relationship that existed and we knew we wanted to serve new Mainers. So that's the first part of your question. And we underestimated how long we would be able to support them with our with our donation. Kathleen, did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. It was a good fit for for a partner. Um, there was a lot of need, but um, based on what we were able to or going to be able to accomplish in the short time that we had, um, St. Elizabeth ended up being the best fit for us. That's awesome. And vice versa. Great. I mean, such an impactful uh, that that infographic you guys have is really just like kind of blows your mind at, at how many people you guys serve, which is awesome. Um, I guess one question I have is, is talk to me a little bit about how being interprofessional in your approach to this project made it stronger or what did you all learn from that experience? I can start with something. I think even in the, the beginning search for a community partner based on everybody's profession, um, everybody had a different exposure level to different greater Portland um, partner potential partners. And so that was even a helpful start um, for us to have all of those perspectives, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take this and then I would really love to hear um, about Austin's experience being in the second cohort, as well as my colleagues. Um, Emily, th this I'm I'm laughing because I'm literally zooming in from the OBGYN clinic at Maine Med where I'm employed now. 
Um, I could talk about reproductive health all day. Austin knows about this. We, his partner actually laughs and, and has to tell us that we cannot talk about medicine or healthcare, you know, when we're, we're out in, in like social lay like world, because like we would literally talk about this all day, but like just the idea of the language that, um, you know, people who menstruate instead of just saying women, um, <laughs> Kathleen knows this, but we had thought if we had had more time, like a whole year of curriculum, we would have developed posters that were in languages that served the people who go to St. Elizabeth's because uh, most of us, English is either our, lang our learning language or the language that we're taught at UNE, you know, using infographics so that we could communicate with the people we're serving. Um, you might have seen this in our poster or former iterations of it. Jen and um, Trisha know this, but when we started thinking about it, we went to tampons because many of us who menstruate have used tampons as athletes or, or just people who menstruate. But they turned back and said to us, please give us pads. We don't get enough pads because there's a cultural um, humility component that the people that we serve use paths. And so that's not necessarily something even from, uh, from, from farmland that maybe we know or maybe that we're aware of immediately. And it was a learning for us. And so um, I, I just feel so passionately about this project. I wish that it was part of our of everyone's curriculum because um, I think it's so important. And now even at the clinic, we have a small pantry that we've built because uh, it, it, it isn't covered by SNAP and, and that's why it exists at St. Elizabeth's. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Austin, so you're carrying this forward. Do you guys have goals that have been informed based on your experience last year and how is it um, evolving? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, this this first inaugural group did such a great job of not just, you know, creating an impactful project that immediately, you know, changed the lives of people that Otherwise, potentially, we're going to lose out on some resources they had come to depend on, but also, I think, setting groundwork to kind of build off of. Um, and I think, you know, the most impactful ways to kind of impact, the, you know, to to make a difference in community is to make sure you're leaving kind of a great framework behind so people can not have to spend the energy kind of starting from step one, but to expand upon that. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> gratefully, we have a really great interprofessional cohort for our group this year, too, and like our group. Um, we have one of the so, uh, very few social workers that's in the reproductive cohort this year, which is great because I think that social workers are an invaluable asset. We have a pharmacy student who's been really great at kind of informing us with some of the interactions that he's had. Um, and, and just in general, I think, um, you know, just having a lot of different perspectives brings more opportunities to potentially in, in find ways to make a larger impact. So some of the ways that we've potentially looked at expanding is... Um, you know, uh, as Bell was kind of hinting at maybe like some educational pieces um, where we could do like some like multi language like printouts and stuff to offer along with these resources, um, potentially reaching out to um, other places that potentially do like more mobile pantry style. So we're still planning on partnering with St. Elizabeth's because we, we really uh, appreciate the relationship that we have with them, but potentially places like uh, Portland Free Pantry or other places that offer uh, mobile resources for people that maybe can't get to St. Elizabeth's. Um, maybe partnering with some of the refugee services. Um, I volunteer with Maine, uh, the MEIRS up here in Lewiston, where I'm doing my rotation. So potentially seeing if there's ways that we can partner with them, depending on the amount of resources we're able to allocate. And I think just because we have the framework in place, having a little bit more time to uh, reach out for not just uh, grants and other things, but like product donations as well, um, is going to hopefully be able to help us be able to um, make a larger impact just based on that we have a little bit more lead in time to to do some more searching for some of those uh, donations. So, yeah, that sounds great. Awesome, very very cool. Um, we have like one minute left, so I'm gonna let's see what what I can say. Um, is there was there any challenge that you guys met that you think um, working in a profession helped you overcome, or what was your largest challenge in this project? Molly or Natalie, do you want to say, or I can jump in. I can jump in if you want. Um, I think probably our hardest challenge was um, being able to be narrow and be flexible because we all came in with like all of these really great ideas of places we could go, places to donate, what we wanted to do, what we wanted it to look like. And then after deciding on St. Elizabeth's, we were so we were trying to um, make the most out of the project that we could while also trying to provide as much as we could. Um, in one of our meetings as a group, we had uh, 
these designs printed up for cards and things like that. And so we were all ready to like handwrite cards. And then after talking to St. Elizabeth's more, they, you know, brought up the problem of like the language barriers. So we were trying to figure out other things we could do instead since we had all these cards. And I think we ended up just using them um, with one of the other um, abortion project going on at the time. But I think just working together to try to be more flexible and to see what they needed and, you know, not being, you know, running away, I guess, with our own ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Such a great lesson. It's interesting as I moderate multiple sessions, it's a very similar learning um, experience that happens in IFTI too, because everybody shows up with all kinds of ideas for what to do for the, the you know, the patient in front of you. Um, and then it's a matter of actually listening to your partner, who is your patient, or in this case, your community partner. And then, you know, like tailoring and, and checking in with what you thought you were going to do and really what their needs are. So such a, a good learning experience that we see coming up over and over again in all of our interactions, um, which is just a great metaphor. Repro reproductive health cohort. I'm very excited about this. Um, we've had... I. I heard there was a lot of pharmacy students in this cohort and I'm just like totally jazzed to learn about what they did in this um, cohort. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait and just make sure that we have everybody from the live stream here with us. Um, and it does look like we are ready to go. So let's go ahead and start that video. Hello, everyone. We are presenting a poster titled yeah. Inaugural IP Reproductive Health Cohort meets community need through partnership, education, and awareness, making a case for deepening reproductive curricula across IP education. I'm here today with three students of the Reproductive Health Leadership Program. Thanks so much, Kathleen. So the purpose of this interprofessional poster really aimed to look at the year-over-year -year outcomes in the proposed planning for last year and this year's mini-grant funded, generously provided by Kate. We are also describing the need that was met last year, and we wanted to talk about menstrual equity writ large in the state of Maine, highlight the process, potential improvements, and talk about what was going on at UNE across IP curriculum. And so why this is important, currently in the United States, people who menstruate spend about $20 on menstrual products per month, which is incredibly costly. When we think about this cost, people might say, well, where does this money come from? How, how am I going to pay for this? Maybe they can get it through their doctor's office or whatnot. This is incredibly time consuming. And when we looked at community partnerships, we saw that there were existing places, but they had lost their funding. We wanted to help meet this need. And we also wanted to be incredibly sensitive to cultural humility. We partnered with St. Elizabeth's Essential Pantry, and we really understood that a lot of folks who were having this need couldn't purchase this product with SNAP funding. St. Elizabeth's averages 285 individuals per week. So the impact of our project, we were able to supply over 21,000 menstrual products to St. Elizabeth. Our donation could serve about up to 175 people for up to six months of menstrual cycles, and that can be depicted in the infographic right in the center. The lessons learned from a project like this are innumerable, but a couple of the key ones that we pulled in order to inform future years are one, that funding is crucial to keeping local organizations running. And therefore, not only will we, we be reapplying for the mini grant, but also looking at other potential grant funding, as well as partnerships with retailers and distributors to ask for donations, as well as listening to your community and their needs. Uh, this can be done by both looking at accessibility and potentially partnering with mobile pantries such as Portland Food Pantry, as well as looking at inclusivity and making sure that the resources provided fit the needs of everyone from trans inclusive packaging to culturally appropriate products. In closing, we hope this project can continue into next year's cohort and a big thank you to the Reproductive Health Leadership Team and St. Elizabeth's Essentials Pantry. Wow. Awesome work. What an impact, guys. Welcome. Um, so I guess my, my first question to the presenters is, um, how did you find your community partner and how did partnering with that um, community partner inform sort of the direction you took with your work? What a great question. Thank you so much, Emily. We were actually also texting as we were watching the video. And um, so first and foremost, uh, one of the team members who's not on, on this call, um, Chester wouldn't mind us sharing this, but Anne, his mom, is part of the board of directors at St. Elizabeth's, and she's been an incredible community partner. I'm going to 
tag Kathleen to jump in, but um, Anne shared with us that we we probably safely underestimated how crucial our donation was. I'll I'll say as a former fundraiser that we wanted to say that in case the monies ran out, in case we weren't able to to jump in year over year. Austin's part of this second year of cohort, but. Um, their funding had ran out. They didn't have a, a funder in the the wings. We understand that we are so graciously funded by um, formerly CC. And so we wanted something that was sustainable. But because of the way that the cohort was organized in their first year, because Chester's mom was on this board, we, we had that relationship that existed and we knew we wanted to serve new Mainers. So that's the first part of your question. And we underestimated how long we would be able to support them with our with our donation. Kathleen, did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. It was a good fit for for a partner. Um, there was a lot of need, but um, based on what we were able to or going to be able to accomplish in the short time that we had, um, St. Elizabeth ended up being the best fit for us. That's awesome. And vice versa. Great. I mean, such an impactful, uh, that, that infographic you guys have is really just like kind of blows your mind at, at how many people you guys serve, which is awesome. Um, I guess one question I have is, is talk to me a little bit about how being interprofessional in your approach to this project made it stronger, or what did you all learn from that experience? I can start with something. I think even in the, the beginning search for a community partner based on everybody's profession, um, everybody had a different exposure level to different greater Portland um, partner potential partners. And so that was even a helpful start um, for us to have all of those perspectives, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take this and then I would really love to hear um, about Austin's experience being in the second cohort, as well as my colleagues. Um, Emily, th this I'm I'm laughing because I'm literally zooming in from the OBGYN clinic at Maine Med where I'm employed now. Um, I could talk about reproductive health all day. Austin knows about this. We, His partner actually laughs and, and has to tell us that we cannot talk about medicine or healthcare, you know, when we're we're out in, in like social land, like world, because like we would literally talk about this all day. But like just the idea of the language that, um, you know, people who menstruate instead of just saying women. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen knows this, but we had thought if we had had more time, like a whole year of curriculum, we would have developed posters that were in languages that served the people who go to St. Elizabeth's because uh, most of us, English is either our, lang our learning language or the language that we're taught at UNE, you know, using infographics so that we could communicate with the people we're serving. Um, you might have seen this in our poster or former iterations of it. Jen and um, Trisha know this, but when we started thinking about it, we went to tampons because many of us who menstruate have used tampons as athletes or, or just people who menstruate. But they turned back and said to us, please give us pads. We don't get enough pads because there's a cultural um, humility component that the people that we serve use pads. And so that's not necessarily something even from uh, from from farmland that maybe we know or maybe that we're aware of immediately. And it was a learning for us. And so um, I, I just feel so passionately about this project. I wish that it was part of our of everyone's curriculum because um, I think it's so important. And now even at the clinic, we have a small pantry that we've built because uh, it, it, it isn't covered by SNAP and, and that's why it exists at St. Elizabeth's. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Austin, so you're carrying this forward. Do you guys have goals that have been informed based on your experience last year? And how is it um, evolving? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, this this first inaugural group did such a great job of not just, you know, creating an impactful project that immediately, you know, changed the lives of people that otherwise potentially were going to lose out on some resources they had come to depend on, but also I think setting groundwork to kind of build off of um, and I think, you know, the most impactful ways to kind of impact, the, you know, to to make a difference to community is to make sure you're leaving kind of a great framework behind so people can not have to spend the energy kind of starting from step one, but to expand upon that. Um, so, you know, 
gratefully, we have a really great interprofessional cohort for our group this year too. And like our group, um, we have one of the so, uh, very few social workers that's in the reproductive cohort this year, which is great because I think that social workers are an invaluable asset. We have a pharmacy student who's been really great at kind of informing us with some of the interactions that he's had. Um, and, and just in general, I think, um, you know, just having a lot of different perspectives brings more opportunities to potentially it, it find ways to make a larger impact. So some of the ways that we've potentially looked at expanding is, um, you know, uh, as Bell was kind of hinting at, maybe like some educational pieces um, where we could do like some like multi-language like printouts and stuff to offer along with these resources, um, potentially reaching out to um other places that potentially do like more mobile pantry style. So we're still planning on partnering with St. Elizabeth's because we, we really uh, appreciate the relationship that we have with them, but potentially places like uh, Portland Free Pantry or other places that offer um, mobile resources for people that maybe can't get to St. Elizabeth's, um, maybe partnering with some of the refugee services. Um, I volunteer with Maine, uh, the MEIRS up here in Lewiston where I'm doing my rotation. So potentially seeing if there's ways that we can partner with them depending on the amount of resources we're able to allocate. And I think just because we have the framework in place, having a little bit more time to uh, reach out for not just uh, grants and other things, but like product donations as well, um, is going to hopefully be able to help us be able to um, make a larger impact just based on that we have a little bit more lead in time to to do some more searching for some of those uh, donations. So, Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Very, very cool. Um, we have like one minute left. So I'm going to, let's see what, what I can say. Um, is there... Was there any challenge that you guys met that you think um, working interprofessionally helped you overcome? Or what was your largest challenge in this project? Molly or Natalie, do you want to say, or I can jump in? I can jump in if you want. Um, I think probably our hardest challenge was um, being able to be narrow and be flexible because we all came in with like all of these really great ideas of places we could go, places to donate, what we wanted to do, what we wanted it to look like. And then after deciding on St. Elizabeth's recently, so we were trying to um, make the most out of the project that we could while also trying to provide as much as we could. Um, in one of our meetings as a group, we had uh, these designs printed up for cards and things like that. And so we were all ready to like handwrite cards. And then after talking to St. Elizabeth more, they, you know, brought up the problem of like the language barriers. So we were trying to figure out other things we could do instead since we had all these cards. And I think we ended up just using them um, with one of the other um, abortion project going on at the time. But I think just working together to try to be more flexible and to see what they needed and, you know, not being, you know, running away, I guess, with our own ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Such a great lesson. It's interesting as I moderate multiple sessions, it's a very similar learning um, experience that happens in IFTI too, because everybody shows up with all kinds of ideas for what to do for the, the you know, the patient in front of you. Um, and then it's a matter of actually listening to your partner, who is your patient, or in this case, your community partner, and then, you know, like tailoring and, and checking in with what you thought you were going to do and really what their needs are. So such a, a good learning experience that we see coming up over and over again in all of our interactions, um, which is just a great metaphor for how all this IPE work translates to, you know, your future practice as as healthcare providers. So thank you guys. That was really wonderful. All right. Well, to keep us on track, then we will now move to our last presentation on social determinants of health and accessibility from an interprofessional standpoint. And this is our PHIT team. So this is team six. And I'm very excited to see what you guys were working on in this program. Go ahead. Jared Robinson, I'm going to be presenting our case today. So our patient was a 34-year-old male from uh, Saco, Maine. He's a farmer who is a part of the Wabanaki tribe suffering from uh, cancer-induced abdominal pain. Uh, past medical history is significant for um, cancer-related and chemotherapy-related uh, symptoms, as well as diabetes, anxiety, depression, hypertension. Uh, medications are focused on pain relief and uh, he's up to date on health maintenance other than vaccination. Um, behavioral risk factors include a uh, diet of red meat, lack of exercise, and uh, drinking three to four uh, beers uh, per day, as well as uh, limited sleep per night. Um, environmental risk factors include uh, 
a labor intensive job, no access to a private vehicle, so relies on public transportation and doesn't have frequent uh, family or social interactions uh, day by day. Social uh, socioeconomic risk factors include uh, being low income, um, being a part of the Wabanaki uh, American Indian tribe, and uh, be, being a recipient of Maine care insurance, which is both a risk factor and a protective factor, as we'll see. Um, for transportation as an intervention, we uh, wanted to utilize main care uh, coverage of transportation to appointments and vaccinations. Um, we'd also like to include a social worker to help navigate uh, his process. Um, uh, for support and community, uh, Wabanaki tribe uh, wellness uh, programs, as well as the Saco Community Center, um, would be good uh, social support. And there's also uh, cancer support groups in the area that he can use as an outlet to kind of work through his diagnosis uh, in a group setting. Um, for his anxiety and depression, um, main care uh, covers therapy, which we can connect him to through uh, their online services um, and provide any other resources if he has other uh, concerns. Um, and for behavioral modifications and education, alcohol is uh, a focus for that we can um, bring some resolution with uh, the Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness Program, as well as AA meetings in Saco. And then sleep hygiene um, can be uh, intervened through education on, on increasing sleep quality and duration. Um, financial assistance, um, there's also main health support um, to uh, gain access to healthy food and good transportation. Um, and then uh, for longitudinal support, um, it's very important to sort of check in uh, from time to time with each uh, visit to make sure that we're serving the needs of the patient um, and their individual experience. And that's our patient. Thank you. Thank you guys for presenting that. Um, I'm not so super familiar. Um, I'm going to call out the question that's in the chat. Um, how did your patient and interprofessional experience participate to your cultural awareness? So. How was being in a professional, how did that assist you in being culturally aware of your interactions with this patient? Um, I can answer uh, on that one. Um, I think uh, part of uh, the interaction we were having with our patient, I'm trying to have a patient-centered approach to their uh, treatment. Um, it was really beneficial to kind of think of how a social worker or a community health worker would be uh, beneficial for uh, kind of tapping into the community services that would be most uh, uh, relatable to our patient um, and, and kind of meeting the needs of the patient from um, a contextualized uh, approach. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, um, sort of the cultural, I guess, unique uh, characteristics that our patient had, um, having somebody like a social worker or a community health worker involved in their care, we would be able to um, kind of know their resources um, like local tribe uh, community centers um, being uh, available for them. Um, and that's something that we would have, for, especially me, I'm, I'm from out of state, so um, I, I wouldn't have really any idea of how to, to approach uh, this patient and, and make a, a tailored uh, treatment plan for them without having somebody uh, who knows the community well. Great, great. And when you guys were presenting this, um... What were the patient's like primary goals of care that they shared with you or that you identified? Yeah, I can go. Um, I think a big goal that we tried to focus on was allowing our patient to keep his autonomy. So in whatever um, kind of, in whatever route that looked like. So um, again, with his pain, trying to help him manage the pain in more um feasible routes because he was taking, um, you know, oxycodone and a lot of other pain meds that weren't completely helping with it. So we wanted to explore routes that allowed him to continue to work. He is a farmer, so he does manual labor. Um, same with not having a car. Sako isn't the best with public transportation, unfortunately. So um, looking into, again, resources and ways that he can feel like he is still in charge of his own care and his own, um, you know, daily activities was important. Mm -hmm. 
And was that was that his goal or was that your goal as you approached it? Both of our goals. I would say it was his goal that we then listened and we're like, okay, we want to um, help you to meet this goal. Gotcha. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, was there, so be, I, it sounds like you, I heard so, a need for social work assistance in this case. Were there other professions that you think would have been helpful in in listening and, and assisting the team in meeting this patient's needs? Yeah, I think um, I we had looked into nutrition counseling. So either like, you know, talking with an RDN or um, someone else experienced in that field. But from what I could gather, the patient was on uh, is on main care. And from what I can tell, main care will not cover nutrition counseling, which is um, unfortunate. So that was kind of a, a setback that we encountered, but that's kind of why we were also looking into farmer's markets in the area and just uh, cheaper options to healthier foods that he could, you know, have access to. Um, yeah. Yeah, great, great, great thoughts. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm always curious about is what did you guys learn from each other in working interprofessionally? that was sort of a takeaway or maybe a learning experience that was a different lens or perspective on that, on that approach to this patient that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, oh, sorry. Did you want to go Jared? I could say, yeah. Okay. Something. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, I live in Louisiana. I go to school uh, at LSU down here at the school of medicine. Um, so part of this uh, project overall, I think that was so beneficial for me is just engaging with people from a completely different region of the country, um, let alone different um, uh, schools and different programs. Um, so I, I feel like that was a, a something that um, I was exposed to a different perspective and approach from um, just different ways of life that we come from. Um, we have a, a whole set of issues that are similar but different in many ways uh, down here in the south um, from what is uh, dealt with like say in this patient's community um, so just coming um, with that approach to uh, caring for this patient and working with a team um, that comes from uh, just different life experiences and different programs it was a very insightful yeah I agree with everything Jared said um, I think just hearing different perspectives and ideas that, you know, I might never have just thought of on my own um, and having all of us kind of as a sounding board for other options. Um, and I agree that having Jared, you know, be in a completely different state and different region was very valuable. So, um, and overall, I, I'm from Maine originally, but I still learned about a lot of resources in the state that I did not know were um, options, which was really cool to experience. So, awesome, awesome. Yeah, um, a great question. Do you guys think that you're going to move in any different directions because of this, or what impact does this have on you? You know, moving forward in your careers as you think about it, and then we'll wrap up so we can get back. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll. Um, it's always been important to me to approach patient interactions through a public health lens, but I feel like now I'm more equipped to do that. I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of systemic barriers that, you know, we can't as physicians necessarily go through, but it's important to think creatively of how we can get patients around them and still reach their goals. Um, so I've definitely learned how to be more creative in problem solving, learn to seek resources that I might not have thought about before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, one thing I'll just reflect on is that um, unless you go through these experiences and discover the barriers for yourself, they're often very invisible from your point of view, trying mm -hmm. to treat a patient. And so it's just so important to understand from the patient's perspective, what challenges are in front of them and, and then recognize that it, those barriers are not their fault. Um, and so I think these things are such great learning experiences because uh, the breakdown in the trust and the relationship between patients and providers is often because we're looking at the same problem from two completely different levels of, of goals and cares and things like that. So really, really impactful experience. Uh, a few more minutes left, Jared, anything else that you think you'll take away from this in the future? 
Yeah, I would say um, this experience and and some of the other uh, interprofessional uh, work I've I've gotten to engage with over the year um, definitely revealed the importance of of having you know a diverse team of, of multiple multiple professions and especially social work and community health uh, workers. Um, I definitely think a priority for my future career um, and whatever ever specialty I end up pursuing, um, it's going to be uh, important for me to have someone who's in touch with the community and has um, uh, a greater reach into the community than I would have. Um, even though I'd hope to have a, you know, a certain level of connection in my community, I know that I can't do at all and, and we have a team to support and and do all the things that we, we know is important for a patient. That's amazing. Thanks guys. Well, um, there should be a, a um, attendance link in the chat. I'm gonna drop it in one more time. If, if you haven't yet filled it out, if anybody here before you drop off the call could please fill out the attendance link. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us for this session and for sharing what you all did. Um, it was really, some powerful experiences that everybody had this semester. So kudos to you all. Okay, this is a case presentation for the Interprofessional Student Showcase event. We are group one from the IPE FIT program and we will be reviewing pediatric asthma, a case of inadequate access. So our patient AB has been suffering from asthma for the last two years and recently has shown with increased shortness of breath over the last four months due to both environmental and genetic factors. AB has several layers of barriers to her treatment for this condition. At the individual level, she is a 10 year old female and in the fifth grade, therefore relying on her family for all healthcare and lifestyle decisions. AB's parents are both smokers who have holistic healthcare ideals. They live in a multifamily home and may have unknown triggers in both the house and their water quality. The family does not have access to a personal car, nor is there public transportation locally. So they do rely on other families that they share their building with for both childcare and transportation needs. There is limited access to specialist care in their area. However, they are within 20 minutes of the nearest hospital. AB's parents have low level of English literacy due to English as a second language and may have difficulty understanding the instructions from healthcare providers. Based on this information, we can suggest various ways um, and levels to help improve AB's condition and prevent disease progression. So the possible interventions that we've identified are um, adjusting the treatment protocol to include a daily inhaled corticosteroids, as well as um, suggesting some alternative um, allergy treatments to the holistic methods that they are currently using. This includes uh, daily showers, maintaining a clean home, and over-the-counter allergy medications. Um, in the case of daily showers, we do have, uh, we've added the water assistance in Maine and um, in case they need help with uh, the water bill. We're also uh, hoping to educate the family on the importance of AB staying up to date on seasonal vaccinations. For the family, we want to educate them on their diagnosis. Uh, Maine has a great self-management education program. We added that as well uh, in home tobacco use education's role on the exacerbation of asthma, which you can also find on that education program. There's also some education on mold and lead contaminants and they can reach out to their landlord um, and they can also have their community health workers reach out to the landlord, which is the next step that we're talking about. Um, the community health workers are able to aid in language translation, healthcare, system notification, community resource connections, and legal matters. Um, the Multicultural Community and Family Support Services in Lewiston, Maine is a community um, health worker program. They have um, both uh, health and legal counsel in Spanish, French, and Somali, which is great because AB is a Somali immigrant. So the parents will be able to get the translation that they need. 
Um, we also want to make sure that they have uh, good access to healthy food. So looking into the Turner Food Bank and nutrition classes, as well as policy advocacy for in-school seasonal vaccinations for all of the kids um, to make sure that AB doesn't have any um, over access to um, getting sick. And for social determinants of health, we want to main, utilize main care transportation services for easier access to doctor's appointments and prioritize the use of a medical translator at all visits. And that goes right back to our community health workers because they're able to ensure that those are there. Thank you so much. Doing this, we found a lot of programs that Maine has for education and for um, adequate use and access to things. And I think that's gonna be something that I look forward to looking into whenever I have patients who I'm not sure how they're dealing with things. It'll give me a lot more information to help deal with patients and um, patients' families as well. Yeah, I think I really just need to echo that. I was really impressed by the number of resources that exist in this area. Um, I'm not originally from New England, so I wasn't sure kind of what systems would be in place to work with. And I think that no matter where we end up practicing as future physicians, it will be really important to look into local resources um, because I know that they exist, you know, nationwide, but it is so dependent on where you are located. Um, what about, because um, you guys were talking about advocating for school, um, you know, for vaccine program. How do you go about to do that? Any ideas? I think, again, you know, the resources that we looked into in terms of this type of a project would vary pretty broadly, depending on where you're located. So, um, you know, in Maine, it's really county based. In certain states, it might be school district based. Um, and kind of depending on the school that your patient attends, if it's private or public, of course, would make a difference. Um, but typically going through the school board is kind of a good place to start. And that can be kind of structured differently depending on where your school is located and kind of their oversight. Um, but contacting the school board and they typically have like a health profession or somebody in that position who helps make decisions as far as medical direction at their nursing facilities and things like that. So I think kind of going at it from that angle would ensure that it's not only targeting one institution, um, but hopefully, you know, district or countywide. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, you're not just helping one kid, you're helping a group. Exactly. I, I had the opportunity to hear the group at the beginning of the semester. So I just appreciated the way you've been able to come forward with it. And um, I, I appreciate the interventions that you came up with. Thank yeah. you for your work on it. It's it's good. I echo what Jen Morton had said earlier. You know, it, it's really nice to see, see your work. Thank students, you. Yeah, really spend a lot of time trying to figure out the local resources. Um, there are a lot of new things I never heard of, and then they find out. Any other questions? Before and they can on. change over time. Ling and I right. were talking about that earlier. You know, it, it is important to check again, because sometimes like during COVID, some things went offline that might have been a resource and mm -hmm. other ones came up in their place. So they do change over time. It's it's good to always keep a, a fresh list of the resources. Right, right. I think there was a, something in the news just yesterday was talking about a uh, translator in in health uh, setting and uh, uh, many people are not really liking this sort of a, a video translator. They actually love to have an in-person translator. Um, All right, this is a JB patient-centered framework for chronic pain. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Dinsdale. I'm a second year student at COM. I'm a part of lovely team five with this uh, great case about JB. Hi everyone, I'm Pavania and I'm also part of team five and I'm an OMS one student as well. Hi, I'm Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Richard. Uh, sorry, I'm, I've got some noise in the background, but uh, I am a year uh, P1 pharmacy student uh, at UNE, and uh, I am part of Team 5. And I'm Maddie. I'm also a scholar in a public area, but um, I'm a D1 at the UNE College of Dental Medicine. This is the case study yes. of JB, a patient experiencing chronic pain. 
We have developed a patient-centered framework to demonstrate the intersection of factors contributing to this condition and brainstorm possible interventions to improve JB's health. JB is a 52-year-old lobsterman living on a remote island in Hancock County, Maine. Throughout his career, he has suffered serious injuries which have left him in chronic pain. This is a list of JB's current medical conditions. He has been prescribed medication to manage his type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and depression, though he admits to taking them inconsistently. JB is a lifelong smoker and had been a social drinker before his recent divorce. His partner was an essential part of his routine and helped him to manage his extensive healthcare needs. The divorce has added additional stress and he notes that his fellow lobstermen have expressed concern regarding his increased alcohol consumption. JB's income is highly dependent on production and the time of year. As a result, he consumes mostly processed foods during the off season. Due to his income, he does not qualify for government assistance, but does not have access to insurance through work. This patient-centered framework, which was developed for the FIT IPE program, demonstrates the intersection of biological, environmental, and socioeconomic factors that interact to make up JB's unique healthcare needs. Given the multifaceted nature of his health, there are several opportunities to provide optimal, individualized care for JB and his lobstering community. JB has limited health literacy as he did not pursue a post-secondary education. However, it's important for patients such as JB to learn how to advocate for themselves within the existing healthcare system. Consequently, it's equally as important for healthcare providers to recognize patterns of need in the patients with whom they interact daily. Advocacy for the integration of training regarding bias and stigma-free language, in addition to broader discussions on health equity, can help patients like JB to seek care earlier. The healthcare system has a plethora of programs to help patients address their needs. However, many programs are unknown to patients without extensive knowledge of the system. Main care partners can provide health education about medical conditions and how to manage them. Free care and or payment plans can help patients think about the financial obligations of care. A social worker may help to provide additional support and bridge the gap between patients and the healthcare system. And counselors and nutritionists may be able to help manage the symptoms of JB's depression and poor diet. These are potential organizations that can provide support and accountability for JB as he navigates his alcohol use disorder. Finally, additional resources may be required in order for patients to successfully manage their healthcare concerns. However, it's often difficult to know where to begin. Programs like the Maine Health Patient Assistance Line exist to aid individuals in navigating the healthcare and insurance systems. Programs like Maine Care can provide transportation to medical appointments and social care networks like Find Help can help individuals search for resources like healthcare, food, and shelter at free or reduced costs. We're open up for questions. Dr. Hall, do you want to start us out? Uh, I'm just interested in knowing uh, what uh, JB's primary goal for care was when he uh, joined this team. So uh, thank you for your question. Um, as a group, there is obviously this case was very complex. We think the first step is trying to help him manage his conditions because he has several comorbidities, especially the chronic pain aspect. Um, but the bigger part that we think his overall goal is, is managing access to care, which is very difficult in the state of Maine. So we were hoping to at least provide him with a list of resources and help connect him to better physicians. Um, granted, his comorbidities, unfortunately, cause him to see various doctors that don't often communicate, which is where we could um, see substance um, use disorder and other issues come into play. So we were thinking the first goal would be try to set him up with one specific position, um, try to find better time granted around his very busy schedule as a lobsterman, and then from there be able to actually manage the conditions itself. So Samantha, I, I uh, lodge you uh, as a group in being so multidisciplinary about your, your goals, but what was his goal? So to add to what Sam said, his primary goal was to manage his chronic pain. Um, but in addition to that, he did come in with a little bit of concern about his increased drinking because his community had mentioned that he had been drinking a little bit more than usual. So he wanted to have a more organized plan for his chronic pain, but also came in with this side concern about the alcoholism. If you guys could, um, let's see, use a little bit of technology. Uh, let's see. Uh... <laughs> 
uh, insurance covered, uh, what would you suggest? Is there anything you can think of? So as a group, we originally started talking about telehealth, um, but we thought we're not so sure about how actually convenient that would be for this patient necessarily while he does have the ability to have wi-fi granted it's a bigger issue surrounding the times of day that he's working because not every physician or healthcare team is able to be as flexible as we would hope um so we were trying to think of maybe like a phone call or something to that aspect where he could be in contact with a physician that he trusts and has built that rapport with um because i feel like wi-fi might not be the most um, feasible aspect we could depend upon for this patient specifically. So I don't know if you guys have heard about something, um, you know, like a medical prescribable apps. Um, so there, there are some available FDA approved for diabetes management. Um, I don't know one for chronic pain, uh, that hopefully something available in the future. Uh, it doesn't require patient, you know, have a, a sort of a cell phone connection. Um, usually once the patient get prescription and they can work with the team from the, the clinics and then they will set up the app on the phone and uh, sort of teach them how to use it. Um, it could uh, provide educational programs. It could uh, provide uh, uh, reminders. So like the diabetes will remind, you know, checking your blood sugar, those kind of thing. Um, and then you can add your sort of a symptoms and your own report. So then the, the physician can get um, information. Uh, it, it could be like a real time information in going back in the force. Um, so hopefully something like that could be, re be used in the future. Did your uh, team include a behavioral health specialist? At finding one, yes, because in the state of Maine, um, I did my MPH through UNE. Um, so finding a behavioral health specialist in the state of Maine is very far and few in between. Um, unfortunately, just due to the demographics in the area, um, that is the goal is to integrate one. So within the list of resources, which at the end of our presentation had a QR code that if you scanned would bring you to the list of different resources and their corresponding sites. They had lists of different behavioral health specialists to help with managing his depression, a nutritionist for diet, um, different avenues to that effect. Um, again, all within a cost efficient um, form for the patient. I was interested in this from a perspective of behavioral health in relationship to managing the chronic pain. I recognize he has co-occurring diagnoses of substance use uh, disorder and uh, affective disturbance, but finding someone who can help him make good behavioral changes in managing his pain would be an appropriate adjunct. I really love that you guys have advocacy as a number one. Uh, that's really important considering one third of individuals suffering from chronic pain uh, in Maine. Um, but yes, yeah, so my name is Gabriel Peckframe. I'm a second year medical student and uh, happy to share this case with y'all. Hi, everyone. I'm Darina Shannon, and I'm a first year graduate student at the Applied Nutrition Program at UNE. Good to be here. Hi, this is PHIT Team 4's patient-centered framework of our patient, Mr. Ryan, and his total gastrinectomy. I'm Julia Barsevich, a first year medical student. Hi, I'm Darina Shannon. I'm a first year graduate student with MSAN at UNE Online. And also on our team is Gabe Peck Frame, a second year medical student, and Katie Santanello, a fourth year medical student. So our patient, Mr. Ryan, is a 41 year old half Korean male, retired US Navy chief petty officer who recently underwent a total gastrinectomy for gastric cancer. His medical history also includes gastroesophageal reflux, nicotine dependence, overweight, major depressive disorder, and post traumatic stress disorder. He resides in Hampton Roads, Virginia with a supportive wife and three children. He has recently been discharged from the hospital and must learn to navigate his new cancer diagnosis, diet post gastrinectomy, previously diagnosed comorbidity, and lifestyle changes associated with his recent retirement. Maintaining an appropriate diet will minimize the chances of post operative complications that might prolong his recovery. We recommend that he eat small, frequent meals that are high in protein and low in added sugars to avoid dumping syndrome. Mr. Ryan should avoid spicy foods, caffeine, soda, and alcohol to help reduce acid reflux, which could cause more harm. We will provide Mr. Ryan with this resource and more for how to ease into this new diet and follow these guidelines. Family support will also play a crucial part in Mr. Ryan's recovery. 
So we suggest formally educating his family and friends on his new diagnosis and new dietary requirements. Despite having good family support, we recommend that he enlist the support of home health services through the VA using his TRICARE benefits so that his wife is able to return to work. Mr. Ryan's healthcare is well managed through his case manager, Alex, at the VA, who also helped enroll him in a clinical trial that utilizes art therapy for those with PTSD. Engaging in physical activity will be critical for his health, so we suggest he engage in the local chapter of the team Red, White, and Blue, which is a nationwide veterans health and wellness organization. Volunteering will also maintain a sense of purpose in his new retired role, so we encourage him to continue to volunteer at the Husky Rescue he was previously involved in. Fortunately, Mr. Ryan lives in a suburban setting with minimal issues of access. We recommend that he work with his team at the VA to identify local farmers markets, stores, or restaurants that are able to provide him options that will fit into his new dietary requirements. Also, they can help him find a safe place for walking near his home. And this concludes our presentation on Mr. Ryan's total gastrectomy. Our multidisciplinary team employed a patient-centered approach and developed a framework that encompasses all his health contributing factors, including individual, family, friends, community, and environment. The framework helped us develop appropriate interventions and provide a holistic approach to Mr. Ryan's treatment. Any questions? Mr. Ryan seems to have a difficult time of it. <laughs> all right, sorry, I was talking without uh, turning my mic on. Um, so I was just uh, saying that uh, the uh, nutritional recommendation was really comprehensive. Um, that really great. We have a dietitian in, in the team. Um, so if no one else asks a question, I want to ask this question. I, you know, plan to ask every team. Uh, how is this experience going to change your future practice? Uh, well, I I think. Um, Ellie and uh, her her team uh, answered it really well. And so I'm going to kind of echo what, what they said in that I think uh, one of the largest lessons lessons for me from this experience and um, process uh, was to always be considering local resources available and to also be always considering kind of all aspects of the patient's uh, life and well-being that we can sometimes miss and overlook when we get caught up in the nitty gritty details. Um, for example, our team um, was late in the game and adding um, any kind of behavioral health. Um, and it was only after the suggestion of, I think, uh, either another another classmate or Dr. Lee or Dr. Chow um, about that. And it was just, you know, I, after they said that, I was like, I can't believe we, we hadn't thought of that. But I think it's just a great example of all of the many different facets um, that go into care and the different types of care that, that someone like Mr. Ryan might need. And you really need a team to care a patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Darina, you want to add something to this? I think that we got lucky with Mr. Ryan. He seems to have a really good support system. Um, considering his social determinants of health, uh, we didn't see too many issues. Um, he lives in a nice neighborhood. Um, he has transportation means. He has access uh, to safe, um, nutritious food. Um, his wife is a nurse. Um, his whole family is just really supportive. So we got lucky with that aspect for sure. Um, but just for the whole experience, it was really wonderful to work with all those talented medical students. It was such an honor for me to learn from them and collaborate with them. Um, and I think we really did a great job coming together and putting all of this, this work together. So I'm really, really happy for that. Right back at you, my friend. Honor to work with you too. Yeah, a lot of nutrition knowledge than what we can provide from the COM curriculum. Ask the students, how will it change your future practice? Like not only do you now know a tremendous amount about each other's scope of training, and responsibility, but there are, you know, many, many other healthcare fields out there that weren't on this case with you that you would wished had been. Um, how do you plan to operationalize getting to know them as well as you now get to know each other? <laughs> that That's a great question. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we're not going to be given such uh, good opportunities with such, you know, time uh, to form these connections and, and work through these kinds of hard problems. Um, but I think overall, it's been a great uh, learning experience. 
um, kind of emphasizing that the fact that there are so many different kinds of uh, health professions and just professions in general that could potentially be of help, maybe not even directly in the healthcare field themselves, um, but that can still be of assistance uh, in a situation like this, like for example, the Husky rescue that Dr. that Mr. Ryan was um, participating in uh, and programs like that. So I think uh, kind of coming back to treating the whole patient and all aspects of the patient and working with all the different fields um, that might contribute to that um, and looking for those for those people to to work in conjunction with. I feel Karina, like uh, curiosity, <laughs> curiosity is going to be your friend, like moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Darina, can you tell us a little bit about your program? Because you're an online student, right? Yes, it's a wonderful program. I'm so happy I found it because it's an FEM model, future education model. So it allows for people from um, non-nutrition backgrounds to come into the field and uh, complete the two-year program and sit for the RD registered dietitian exam at the end of the two years. So we do academic work concurrently with um, our exposure to clinical um, as well as food service management and community um, hours. It's called supervised experiential learning. So sort of similar to internship, but uh, just named differently. But it's a very accelerated program, fast paced. Um, and I'm really, really happy I found it. It's one of the very few in the nation, actually, that allows for such streamlined process. So I'm very, very happy that I'm a part of it. It's been great so far. That's great. It would be nice that, uh, you know, we can incorporate you guys into our comp curriculum as well, because uh, we try to teach some nutrition, but it's definitely not enough. Uh, just give students a little bit of flavor in, uh, you know, things they might encounter in the future. Um, just for all the future doctors out there, please do not use albumin as a sign of malnutrition. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, so this is the final talk for um, this uh, uh, patient framework track. Uh, this is a very interesting case as well, um, a case study on the HIV patient in May, All right, from uh, FIT Team 3. This presentation is part of the UNA Public Health Problem Solving and Interprofessional Teams Project for Fall 2023. My name is Julie, and I'm a student of dental hygiene and psychology. Nazifa and Brittany are both students of osteopathic medicine, and we're here to discuss Ms. Brown and HIV, along with barriers that unhoused individuals face when seeking medical treatment. Ms. Miranda Brown is a Caucasian female, age 26, who is presenting with symptoms related to HIV infection and substance use disorder. She has recently lost her health insurance coverage as a dependent, which has led to the cessation of her antiretroviral therapy treatment for HIV. She has been unhoused for several years and is also suffering from food insecurity, insomnia, and depression. As the unhoused crisis continues to grow in America, it is up to us as healthcare professionals to be aware of our state and local assistance programs so that we can share those resources with those individuals and families who do not have direct access to medical care. Hi everyone, my name is Nazifa and I'm a first year osteopathic medical student here at Unicom. So moving on to what brings Ms. Brown to us in clinic today, this slide just shows the information we were able to gather for her first visit. So she has that history of HIV and recent non-adherence to her medications, which has contributed to the symptom that she's presenting with, such as intermittent fevers, cough, the rapid weight loss. She's also in a highly stressful environment because she is undomiciled and unable to have adequate sleep at night. Thankfully, she has a good support system with friends and family, but it's just difficult for her to maintain contact with them. So we really wanna focus on the aspects in Miranda's life that were more modifiable. So that includes like her housing and insurance status, her diet. We recognize that although these are very significant barriers that take a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of patience to overcome, her resilience and her commitment to positive change provides that really solid foundation for her to move forward with that holistic care plan that we'd like to initiate for her. So that includes her working with the case manager, receiving job training, and seeking drug rehabilitation. And it's also a plus that she lives in a city like Portland, which is filled with so many different resources, so many different services to help those who really need them. She just needs some guidance to seek them out and then also navigate them. In order to ensure that Ms. Miranda Brown gets the care that she needs, we have come up with a series of potential interventions that we think could help her. 
The first step is to initiate a care plan through the Portland Free Clinic and have her be seen by a medical provider for treatment and immediate relief of the current symptoms that she's experiencing. We would then like to encourage her to visit the Franny Peabody Center. In here, they will set her up with a case manager who can assist her with paperwork, treatment plans. They can provide HIV medications and also connect her to counseling through the Ryan White program. This organization can also assist her with finding housing, employment, and they can help her enroll in main care. We would then like to consult her family for reconnection in order to provide Miranda Brown with more emotional support. Lastly, we would identify and help facilitate enrollment in drug prevention and rehabilitation programs. One facility is Crossroads, which assists women with drug treatment and is located nearby, so it could be an excellent resource for her. All in all, we hope that these interventions are tools that she can use in order to get her back on track in terms of taking her HIV medication, seeking counseling and help for her drug addiction, and also place her in a more stable environment and off the streets. All right, so um, can team members uh, identify yourself? first and before we ask a questions. I'm Julie. I'm Brittany. I'm a second year medical student at COM. And Julie, I'm do you wanna, I'm a first year. All right, Julie, do you want to identify which program you're from? Oh, uh, dental hygiene uh, with a minor in psychology. I'll start out. Um, so how is this experience to change your, is going to change your future practice? At least I think, maybe. I think like one of, um, the interesting things about this case is that it's very applicable to what could be seen in the real world, especially in a city like Portland. Um, and I think being able to get to know some of the resources that these patients can be connected to through social workers was really eye-opening. And I, you know, didn't know that uh, case managers like at the Franny Peabody Center could actually go out and visit these people in the public if they couldn't even get to the center. So um, it was really eye-opening to learn about the accessibility of some of these resources. Um, I guess I'll add to that. Um, I, I think to understanding that when patients usually come in to see somebody, it's because they have an immediate issue that they need to address that they can no longer ignore. And a lot of times there's a lot of comorbid factors that are included with that. So kind of having a bigger picture on how to address immediate issues and then work towards addressing additional issues that will help kind of correct or balance those in initial issues, I think is very important. And, and also again, like Brittany was saying, it's just understanding what resources you have available locally. I mean, what we have here in Portland is different from what is up North in Bangor and, and so on and so forth. So understanding what's accessible to your patients and having empathy, you know, when they come in and, and not making judgment and just, you know, just trying to help them to your best of your ability by giving them resources and, and helping them seek those resources out if you can. Yeah, and I completely agree with, with these two. And I also was super um, impressed with how accessible some of these resources and services are, um, where like as a physician, you can recommend your patients to be doing things, but then also providing them the actual names of buildings and names of services that they can actually go to instead of just saying, okay, yeah, go monitor your blood pressure instead of actually <laughs> um, giving them that source. So I really, really appreciated seeing all the resources that we were able to provide there. So there's a I did question in the chat about the implicit bias. Yes, yeah, so the All implicit right. bias. So I, I think absolutely. I think, you know, when, when you see somebody that's unhoused, you immediately think a lot of, you have a lot of assumptions about, you know, how they're not taking care of themselves or it, it, and it's, it's hard to realize that, you know, they may want to take care of themselves. They just may not know how to or have access to things. And I think not being judgmental and really just taking a step back and putting yourself in their shoes, how they might be feeling, even just coming to you and how how brave that is of them to, you know, overcome their own challenges to come and see you. I think uh, as long as you're non-judgmental and, and you kind of check yourself at the door, then I think that's a really good approach. Brittany and uh, Nazif, do you want to add to this? I think that um, I was lucky enough that I had just in my curriculum this past year, I had just come off of learning about HIV and treatment options. And we had a whole discussion with a physician in the field about 
biases and everything. So I don't think I understand that there are biases that we are all going to constantly face. But I think in terms of crafting it, I didn't experience any biases. I think um, maybe the only thing is like for me, like I'll be in the role as a physician. So I think that I have some barriers in terms of what I can do of providing the person in this case with housing and connecting to resources. So I'm just going to have to lean on other providers in the health field to help make those connections for my patients. Yeah, I think that's a completely fair point. This patient was actually inspired by um, a patient that I saw in urgent care during my career gap years who had the history of HIV. Um, And I think it's super important that when they're coming to you in that vulnerable state for everybody on the care team, whether it's like the person at the receptionist, the triage nurse, and everyone so forth, is able to address everything with care and just with some sensitivity. And that that experience sort of like kind of um, helps me to, uh, in my future practice, to be able to have that sensitivity as well. So uh, from this experience, what surprised you the most? I think that from this experience, I was, um, I had also done the the IPD project, so the interprofessional um, teamwork that was very, you know, patient oriented with like a lot of different medical providers involved, and so I think I was surprised in this situation how just seeing how little um, involvement we kind of set up in terms of like healthcare based, like we really focused on a lot of a lot of other social aspects that do relate to a person's health. But that was just interesting to see how many um, social aspects we wanted to cover and make sure that we connected her with interventions. So Julie, I really want to hear uh, your perspective too, because you're the only uh, dental hygiene the student dental. we have. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, the slight gingivitis isn't exactly her biggest uh, concern right now. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, dental offices that do not accept main care. Um, but main care does offer dental services for people who are in need. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, you know, I think people think of um, uh it, it's hard. Like I would love for, for dental care to be part of healthcare and be included in health insurance. But um, there are clinics. In fact, UNE, uh, the dental hygiene clinic is a clinic where people can come and we do accept main care and we do um, scaling cleaning. We, we assess, you know, physical health, oral health. We take vitals. You know, we have really great advice for patients. Um, so knowing that those resources are there, you know, kind of spreading the word um, that we, you know, we can absolutely help you out and we can send you referrals to places that will accept your insurance um, if you are covered like under the Affordable Care Act. So really great. Excellent. I love to Coming give to dental hygiene. Final. I love to give dental hygiene the last word. We're so glad to have you uh, participate in our IPE activities. Thank you, Ling so much for being a uh, uh, flexible and patient um, faculty facilitator for our session today. I apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties, but um, and I thank everyone for their participation. I hope you will complete the attendance form before you leave. Let us know how we did, and I hope that you will continue to be lifelong friends and team members. Thank you, Chris. Um, you made the session smooth, um, you know, whichever uh, difficulties we had. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully we enjoyed the session and uh, everything um, is recorded. Right, Chris? So uh, you can uh, visit other tracks and uh, look at all those uh, presentations as well. Great. Thank you.